Welcome to Mysterium Fasci's episode 15. We're joining you today for another very special episode of Ario Occult Mysterium Theater 1488. Uh, joining us today, we have a very special guest, a man who I greatly admire and whose worldview is basically more cogent than anybody I've ever uh, encountered, with the exception of Raphael Johnson. So we have uh, Jay Dyer, jaysanalysis.com. Thanks, Jay, for joining us. Thank you. Glad to be here. You know, it's, it's really, I'm not exaggerating, it's an honor and a pleasure. I'm a very big fan of your work, and you know, I would suggest that um, all of our listeners go out and purchase a subscription because it's really definitely worth the money. Joining me, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I, there will be more philosophy this year. Uh, I know that we took the detour into tragedy and hope, but <clears throat> you know, before that we were doing Plato. So we, next there's going to be, uh, I think I'm going to do Marcus Aurelius's uh, meditations will be the next thing I cover. Fantastic. Yeah. The tragedy, I listen to uh, every episode of the tragedy and hope, and I think it's, it's actually absolutely essential um, just to cool. kind of get a big picture view. Mm -hmm. Joining me as co-hosts, I've have Grieva Hans. Thank you, Grieve. Yeah, it's good to be here. And once again, after a little bit of a hiatus, I have Spies. Thank you, Spies. Good to be here. It's uh, good to be on with you, Jay. Big fan. Excellent. So we got a we got a couple of different topics that we want to talk about. I mean, you, Jay, your your area of expertise is is so broad and comprehensive that there's so many different things that we could make an entire episode just talking to you about. So I've kind of picked out a few different things which I think will be useful to discuss. And the first one I, I think maybe we ought to go into is, you know, Esoteric Hollywood. So you, you've just released your new book, uh, Esoteric Hollywood. So do you want to talk about, you know, kind of in uh, just a little pithy pitch as to what's going on with that? Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I like movies and I've always liked movies and I wanted to do comedy and that's what I always, <clears throat> I always thought I would end up doing when I was younger because I was very active in theater and, and all that kind of stuff. And then as you get older and you learn more about the world, you realize that, oh, you know, you're like a white dude. You're not really welcome in that world, <laughs> most likely, <laughs> yeah. unless, you, unless you pretend to be like a total Democratic Party operative or something. So I kind of I kind of lost the fervor and zeal that I had for you know, doing something in terms of of uh, theater and the arts. So I just went the route of philosophy in college and, and theology. I was I started at Bible college for a while, and then I decided that the Baptist faith was retarded and stupid. So I <laughs> yeah. and got into, for a long time, uh, Cal uh, Catholicism and Thomism and then all that kind of stuff. And then over the, over the years, made my way gradually towards orthodox theology and traditional orthodox thought and uh but all throughout that period even when i was getting into conspiracy related stuff when i was like 18 or 19 i was still interested in film still interested in movies and it just kind of was a side hobby so i guess the irony is that even though most of my time and attention and focus was on philosophy and you know undergrad and grad school and reading all these guys and, and going to debates and I mean I literally would drive across the country and you know go go hear guys debate theism and atheism and Darwinism and evolution and, and anything that that was interesting and but I ended up I never would have thought that the book that I would end up writing would be a book on movies so the first book that I and I hopefully eventually I'll have you know books on philosophy and metaphysics and things like that too that's at least my plan but it just so happened that the the first book ended up being movie related. So yeah, I, I did um, over the last six or seven years. I just as a, as a side project, you know, I was like throwing up movie analyses for fun, and I'd read a lot of Michael Hoffman's stuff over the years, and uh, you know, the author of Secret Societies and Psychological Warfare and Judaism Discovered and many other many other books, and. So Hoffman had this analysis of um, conspiracy theory with Mel Gibson a long time ago. It's been on the internet since the late 90s, and I always thought it was a neat approach to movies. And then when I was in my undergrad and I was taking 
uh, some film classes, Hollywood history classes and stuff like that, I, I realized that actually there's a lot of conspiracy in film. So it just treats of that topic in general and it covers kind of your major directors like uh, Hitchcock and Spielberg and Kubrick and, and some David Lynch as well. And although it may might seem totally unrelated to the types of subjects that we cover, actually, I don't think that it is. I mean, for example, I just did a talk on Seraphim Rose's book, Orthodoxy and the Religion of the Future, and there's quite a few places in that book where H.G. Wells and Spielberg and all this kind of stuff comes up. So I don't, I don't think that, that they're all unrelated topics. I, I'm a kind of a holistic thinker, so I tend to see things big picture and how everything interrelates and try to integrate things. So what this book is is just maybe a collection of several years of my thought about and reflection on movies that maybe I'd grown up with, everybody's grown up with, if you grew up in the 80s especially, so there's a lot of, you know, Spielberg 80s stuff, there's uh, E.T. And, and like Labyrinth and Ridley Scott movies, Blade Runner, that kind of stuff. So if you like the art of filmmaking, and I, I do think it's a, a, an art that I find fascinating, uh, then, then this is a good book. It's a book that deals with geopolitics, it deals with the esoteric, it deals with um, you know, philosophical concepts, ancient philosophy, Platonism, and how all of that relates to modern, I guess you would say, preeminent directors, right? Uh, so, yeah, it's 363 pages, and it's uh, over 50 or 60 sidebars, which makes it over 400 pages, so pretty well sourced. Um, yeah, so it's been out about a month, and I've had, I think, except for one gothic feminist who hated the book and obviously didn't read it because she said she said in her review on amazon that uh that i don't believe any book that tells you that we're all run by alien overlords hmm. <laughs> and uh yeah. hmm. I spent, well aren't we i spent about 30 pages arguing against the existence of aliens so <laughs> she obviously didn't read the book have, uh, you know <laughs> if I'm, so, that's a yeah. uh, very valuable critique i can tell yeah but the other 20 or 30 reviews on uh, Amazon and Goodreads are all five stars. So the recept reception has been great. And, you know, if you're, if you're a movie nerd like me and you like philosophy and you like conspiracy and you like, you know, any, any of these other topics, cults, intelligence agencies, blah, 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 this is the book for you. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, that's one of the things that um, I, I think uh, I actually found out about you through my friend Spies here. He introduced me to your work. But I had first, um, I kind of come, you know, I came into this background where I'm, what I'm doing now, actually in much this, like a similar way that you did. Like I was into conspiracy a lot in my youth from my father. And so I had heard you and um, uh, Pharrell um, oh, yeah. on various podcasts, Caravan to Midnight, that kind of stuff. And I had, I actually, I came out of the same thing, you know, Catholicism, traditional Catholicism to orthodoxy. Um, so I'm in a similar position, like, and I, I perfectly understand. And that's what really why we wanted to get you on is because you and Dr. Raphael Johnson, who we've had on several times on the show, have, um, you know, the most holistic, the most cogent, like, narratives and worldview. And one of my favorite quotes from Dr. Johnson is that uh, if it doesn't make sense, it's not true. Yes, I would totally agree with that. Yeah, and that's that's the thing is there are very few, especially we're going to get into this a little bit later on, but especially in like the alt right or the far right, there are very few people who actually seem to examine every single piece of the picture as far as worldview goes, and so many times there'll be these kind of like glaring fields of omission that they will just refuse to interact with. Like conspiracy is a big one. Um, it might have been you on Red Ice after the Texas shooting had happened, and you were critiquing. Um, kind of the alt-right's kind of blind acceptance of the mainstream media narrative of what had occurred. Right, which they, they tend to do quite often, and that, that's that's been my consistent critique of the alt-right, yes. Right, and that's something that we, um, we're we sensitive to, and we've actually, several of the limit panelists here have been harshly critiqued on various like forms and things in the past because for that very reason, you know, we questioned the mainstream media narrative and said, mm -hmm. you know, look guys, just because it's useful to you doesn't mean it's true. Exactly. Yeah. In fact, uh, I, I'm not at all pro-Islam, but I saw, I think, Breitbart or one of the right-wing 
alt light sites. I forgot what it was. They were posting um, images of supposed riots by by Muslims in Germany for like Oktoberfest or something. I forgot what it was. It wasn't even riots. It was like people shooting firecrackers and one firework hit almost dude. Now, I, the, so that's not true. Right? But I'm not also not going to admit that Merkel isn't, uh, you know, in, intentionally wanting to bring in a totally different culture. Of, of, right. I mean, it's attempting to genocide of the German people. Right. Yeah. And, and I talk about this constantly. So it's I don't understand why people have such a hard time figuring this out. It's, it's not. I mean, Kelly Greenhill, I've, I've posted her uh, her paper many times that talks about weaponized migration, right? So the the consistent left, I guess you might call it, maybe the the Sibel Edmonds types or these kinds of people, you know, they'll they'll talk all day about things like, uh, you know, the, the Syrian people have a right to their nationality and heritage, and I would agree with that. I would, and I agree that the war in Syria is wrong. And then they'll turn around though, and but they won't allow that for me. Like I'm not allowed to have my heritage, right? Well, so, you're a white so man. This is, right, this is the the, the, the uh, hypocrisy of, of that kind of a, of an anti-war left that's, that's left. You know, the anti-war left kind of went underground the whole time that Obama was there with left cover. Uh, right, bombing other other countries and so forth, and then suddenly now that Trump's uh, here, oh, the anti-war left reemerges from under the rocks, right? Where they, where, where have they been? But uh, anyway, this that's a totally different topic. But yeah, no, I mean, I, we could we could probably get into any tangents and just follow them all day. But I want to, I want to kind of go back to this. So. On the subject of esoteric esoteric Hollywood, I mean, we've we've kind of talked about this before on the show. I mean, that Hollywood's has is enormously influential because they're the primary culture formers, along with academia. Yep. yep. Right, and you know, I, I mean, of course, we we know um, because you, you know you're trained in theology, you know the maxim: it's uh, lex credendi, lex orandi, right? And so your your core beliefs and the way you pray determine your life. And so, I mean, that's the thing is what Hollywood gives us is an, is an integral worldview full of, you know, as you would say, the presuppositions that are yeah. left undeconstructed. And so when we kind of accept the, the narratives that are being given to us from Hollywood, I mean, they literally shape our, the entire view of, of the universe, um, yeah. our I mean, metaphysical this... system. And so I guess what I would just wanted to talk about is, you know, and this is going to be kind of a broad question, but like Hollywood – as a control mechanism vis-a-vis -vis culture formation and maybe like relating that, you know, back a little bit to MK Ultra. How does Hollywood kind of brainwash America and the world and, you know, box it into a certain worldview? Well, what I started with in the book was talking about Hollywood and film viewed from a religious or ritual perspective. And that's what a lot of people don't do. They don't think about the world that way anymore because everybody's sort of living under the the spell of this notion that we that since the enlightenment we have obtained objectivity and neutrality right and so prior to that the world was in darkness and we had dark ages and superstition reigned and then with uh, John Locke and uh, Diderot and Voltaire and these characters suddenly light has come and now we, we have objectivity, right, because of the scientific revolution and, and so-called science has allowed us to uh, to figure out that, you know, you can look at an earthworm and inspect its length and uh, squish its guts out on your finger and smell the earthworm and taste the worm. And once you've figured out all of its properties, you can then expound uh, and extrapolate from that that it's uh, millions of years old and from what uh, species it evolved and so forth and so on. So, But none of that's true, right, because there's no such thing as a completely objective, neutral approach to uh, the, the, the Are you the sure, phenomenon. Jay, there's no empirical brute facts, the, these platonic no. forms floating out there that we can hit people with? No, there's no brute facts, and that's that's something that Again, the, like the majority of people still live under this delusion. And one of the great things that, that I liked about Spangler was in Decline of the West, where he, he talked about this, that we're still 
we're still living under the spell, the, the, the skeletal remains of the, the Enlightenment period, and it's eventually going to die off because it doesn't make sense. It is, it's inherently contradictory with itself. Now, I'm not, I don't agree with everything Spengler says. I'm not a historical relativist or a cultural relativist, but uh, I think that's a great insight. And so when I approach Hollywood and film and, and things like that, I, I look at all these things from a religious perspective because I know that ultimately that's how man functions and operates. Humans are constituted to be religious beings, even in their irreligion. They are fiercely religious, and I think uh, Nietzsche made made this point in uh, *Ecce Homo* or, or one of his one of his books. It was a long time ago when I read it, but he's you know he talks about the pale faced atheists who are are basically evangelists for for atheism, and he said that they're just as stupid as the Christian evangelist. Uh, and I think he's right at, to a certain degree there at that point. Um, I mean, he realized what. What the the atheists don't realize is that you're just operating still on the presuppositions that there is objective truth, and you know Nietzsche's point is that there's not really objective truth, right? So, in the same way, when we come to anything in life, and and I generally think that people that call Darwinism or scientism or religion are totally on point. That's absolutely correct. I believe there's a, a famous essay by a. Oh, um, what's that guy's name? He's the, uh, not William Lane Craig, that guy's an idiot, but the other, uh, the other Protestant guy, like a Calvinist dude, anyway, I can't remember, but he wrote a famous, uh, paper about Darwinism and scientism as a religion, uh, Calvinist philosopher at some college, I forget what his name is, very well known, but anyway, that, that, that paper's really good and it illustrates the point. Uh, and that's what I would agree with. And so when, anyway, I'm getting philosophy crazy here, but when we talk about Hollywood, it's no different because anybody that makes a film has a worldview or in the case of perhaps propaganda films with the military or the intelligence agencies or the Pentagon or whoever embedding their messages into movies, they have a worldview right now. It might be to convince people to join the war effort or, uh, to convince people over time to accept transgenderism or whatever. Uh, those those things are all very real, but they represent some perspective or worldview. And in my view, the problem with America and Americanism is that it is double think from the get-go. So when you look at the Founding Fathers, you kind of have this collection of miscreants and, and Masons and Deists and weirdos Baptists and Episcopalians and maybe a couple Catholics, uh, and they're all trying to come together under this banner of a propositional nation. There's never been a nation created under, the, under a proposition before, right? Uh, nations historically have always been based on ethnoi uh, and their belief system and their language, right? So, well, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned that. I'm in a, uh, I'm in a, an Orthodox kind of uh, traditional fellowship. And before I came on to the show, I asked them if they had any questions that they wanted to put to you. And one of them said, I'm going to read you a quote. He said, recently you had a Facebook post where you mentioned uh, the concept of ethnoi, and you you know used a couple of biblical passages to back up what you were saying. And this fellow says that his question to you is, um, is it possible in America to actually develop a serious ethnoi where the identity is so integrally wrapped up in these Enlightenment concepts? I don't know. I keep going back and forth on that because like a year ago, two years ago, I would have said no way because uh, I just didn't think anything. I, so we're way too far down the toilet and we probably still are. So I'm not I'm not sure what Trump represents yet, but I, I, I've taken a, a positive approach to Trump with with some criticism. So the, the point I'm the reason I say that is just to say that uh, there is reason for optimism. There's reason for hope. Uh, I think that we start to realize that the the globalists, the oligarchs, the elite, whoever, the, the those that, that are running our country are not God. They're not infallible. They're not uh, indestructible. And so uh, if you, that we really can have victories and we can change things, it really is possible. And I just kind of 
I'm actually chiding myself because I've had such a, a defeatist, cynical, negative attitude for a long time that I think was, you know, you just get beat down by stuff over time and you feel like, you know, contra mundo, it's you against the world. And then you realize that you actually can. I mean, I never would have thought that I'd have a book and be able to talk about, you know, critiquing Darwinism. Now, I'm not saying my book's going to change the world or anything, but I mean, I just never would have thought that you know, five years ago that you could write a book and include a chapter critiquing Darwinism on Hollywood. <laughs> that to, right. me, would just, that yeah. to me would have just seemed, you know, just like, oh, that's never going to happen. So I mean, you know, a big part, a big part of the enemy's psyops is demoralizing people. And this is what I've really tried to come to grips with. And I actually, the more I think about it, I think that's what Orwell's book is about. Uh, I don't think George Orwell was, I mean, he could have been a good guy. I don't know. There's all these stories about he, you know, went to hide in Scotland or something and that he always thought they were going to come kill him. Maybe that's true. But when you read 1984, it's a, intentionally a book that leaves you with no hope. And this is a book written from the perspective of, I believe, the British Royal Society Illuminists. Uh, and the, 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 I believe it's a, it's a psyop because the whole point of the book is that there's nowhere to look for hope. There's nowhere to look for change. The boot is going to stamp your face for all eternity. So it's a very demoralizing book, even though it's very revelatory. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's yeah, kind so, of same with, uh, with brave new world. I mean, the end, the, the guy yeah. hangs himself, right? Exactly. And Great point. The, the thing is that all of this system, it has no meaning in and of itself. I mean, science, just for the sake of science, it's useless. It's just will it's to power. But this will to power has no goal. So it's you, you could argue that it's a slavery to the desire of power. And, I mean, if you're going to make a, a bit of a historical comparison, there is this legend of Alexander the Great and uh, Diogenes. Mm -hmm. Now, Diogenes, he lived in this uh, little uh, barrel or whatever it was. And Alexander the Great saw, uh, said to him, I will grant you whatever you wish. Now, Diogenes said, just stay, stay just go away. Uh, let me have my sunlight. Mm -hmm. So, Diogenes wasn't as enslaved to this desire for power. So if you're going to use this, you know, uh, Augustinian mindset that you have as many uh, masters as you uh, uh, have, uh, you know, uh, uncontrolled desire, so to speak, Passions. then Diogenes was, yeah, then Diogenes was more free than Alexander the Great. He was more powerful than Alexander the Great. That's um, a good point. Yeah, and, uh, it reminds me of Max Weber's book, uh, Spirit of Protestantism, and all that, where he's, you know, he talks about capitalism being uh something that derives from puritanism and all that which a lot of that's i think relevant and true obviously i don't agree with we're going to get into that when we discuss the anglo question yeah i don't agree with max faber's uh democratic socialism obviously but uh, when he talks about the rationalization process which is the main point of that book that monopoly capitalism develops into by by its own inherent logic He's absolutely right that, and this is, I think I wrote a paper when I was in doing that book in undergrad. And my argument was that point was like, okay, so we've got this giant rationalization process. Okay, so we're going to be run by Google and Microsoft and all this kind of stuff. Uh, but what is the purpose of the rationalization process? Because reason and rationalization presuppose telos. They presuppose some sort of purpose or goal to which the the syllogism is moving you right through the the force of the logic is moving you to some point or conclusion in the argument and so in the same way if we look at giant corporations and, and systems and systems analysis and you know how microsoft works and how the computer works and all this kind of stuff that it, it's all very rational very logical and it's supposed to be moving towards something but there's no goal because they're totally nihilistic, right? Well, no, Jay, don't you see utilitarian morality is all that exists. It's all just, yes. you know, competing for evolutionary advantage. I mean, we're hedonists, you know? I mean, the only thing we're conquering at this point is just infant void. It is, right. And so there's like, a, I think Dugan calls it the monotonic process where it's like a, a never ending sequence of progress in a certain direction for no reason whatsoever it's just it's just assumed that progress quote unquote is is a self-evident maxim and it's also just assumed that it's moving in the right direction and it's also just assumed that 
uh, it's either going somewhere or going nowhere. And then, like you said, what what is the point? <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, Dr. Johnson makes this point, you know, that uh, if anybody ever promises you anything but doesn't give you the end goal, you should not believe them. Yeah. Uh, he's talking yeah. specifically about Marxism. It's like, yeah, we need the revolution. Revolution for what, exactly? Right. And I, you know, that's why I was, in fact, I woke up this morning thinking about that. And I was thinking about how everybody lives under all these promises of things like, and I was just thinking about what, so we talk about globalism and I was reading all these think tank papers yesterday and they're always talking about, you know, the growth of global capitalism and globalism, the hope of globalism. No, it never says what it is. <laughs> what is the hope? Right? Well, yeah, like, what it, is it's the just, all this? I mean, this, this is kind of what Spengler talks about as well in the decline of the West, you know, this super Faustian mentality is progress for progress sake. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, just meaningless platitudes. They don't have any yeah. significance. And it's just more like propaganda than it is anything else. Exactly, exactly. So yeah. so you end up building this huge machine, and uh, <laughs> then you're kind of stuck there. That may have been the point. I mean, it's kind of atheistic. I don't agree with it. But that movie, it makes me think of that movie, uh, Zero Theorem, that Ridley Scott movie that's really weird with Christoph Waltz, where he's... He's like running this giant machine, and he's waiting for the the, the God code that gives it all meaning. <laughs> and he just sits. In, he's like he sits in this like giant facility. It's like an old cathedral that's a giant computer facility. And all he does every day is like punch these little buttons. He's like a code writer, oh. right? And then he discovers that it that there is no like meaningful God code. It's all just irrational like you just built this giant machine that's pointless uh and so i mean it's very nihilistic but it's illustrative for the pro point of making you know th this argument to to the atheist or the, the nihilist or whoever it's just sort of like yeah. w w you built this giant machine it has no meaning so you might as well just blow it all up right and a lot of people i think people like lenin and and these uh nihilists who are more consistent come to that conclusion they're like well yeah actually okay it's all meaningless yeah, it's all flux, <clears throat> right? We actually we had a discussion, um, and I'll open this, give this back to Spies and, and Grieva Hans. Uh, we had um, Dr. Johnson on a couple of episodes to discuss like the philosophical and theological um, basis of Freemasonry and Kabbalism, mm -hmm. and that basically was our conclusion: is that well, you know, they don't, they just believe it's all flux. They don't actually believe in ontology or yeah. telos or, you know, an end. I mean, what what these. The, the only thing I can I can imagine that these people are trying to do is they, they're little Luciferians, they're literally anti-Christian, they're trying to build the synagogue of Satan, because as we know, Satan can't create anything in and of itself, he can only pervert something. So what he's trying to do uh, is, all this is just trying to pervert that which is already created, it's like dissolving it into a sort of prime matter, then build something new from it. Yeah, I think that's why they're so obsessed with like transhumanism and extending life. Because if yeah. like you take this nihilistic ideology to its logical conclusion, well, of course you're going to want to live forever because there's no, you know, you don't believe in heaven or any kind of afterlife. Yeah, AI antichrists. Yeah, my, Mark Hackard and I had a, a good interview a couple of years ago. We were we were talking about this, and uh, we, we got to laughing because it was like, well, so so you build a giant like let's say transhumanism happens in, in the fullest sense and you build like some giant robo chariot by which you're, you're going to fly around the galaxy. And then, <laughs> then it's just you as a robot robot flying around the galaxies, like, you know, like how 9,000 or something. And, or like, uh, the <sighs> Dr. Manhattan <laughs> in Watchmen. <laughs> like you're, yeah. So you're, like what's the so, end so the, goal? So it's just you, right? So yeah. like the last, uh, transhumanist globalist, uh, person, like, George Soros has like melded with the bots and he's flying around alone in the universe. And then, so what do you do then? Well, I guess you just blow up planets and then you just blow everything up. So what else is there to do? Uh, I mean, it's just totally, yeah, it's total nonsense, but the, uh, it makes me think of Camus. Doesn't he argue that you should just kill yourself? Like, why not? <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's I mean, the existentialist I mean, thing. There's, there's, if, once you take that route, yeah. Once you take that view, there's no moral, there's no uh, benchmark of qualification by which to say that there's a preference for existence or non-existence. Yeah. Like to say that you should exist assumes some notion of the good still, right? But you've already you've already jettisoned all that. There's no 
Right. Well, yeah, exactly. There's precisely, there's no ontological grounding. And I mean, there's a, a really famous quote is a, or not famous quote, but something clever is a nihilism is easy to start, but hard to finish. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Right. Well, the, the whole thing about I, that we might as well commit suicide, something here, uh, it's kind of self-contradictory, right? Because if life is meaningless, then we might as well live. And this assertion that life is meaningless, it's, yeah, exactly. It, it's purely intellectual. And we know that there's certain things you can't explain. Uh, art, for example, you can't explain art, you can't explain why a painting is beautiful, it just is. This proves that there's something more than what you can just intellectually explain. So therefore, we might find a meaning in life in that which we can't explain. I mean, the, the meaning is separate to that which we, uh, you know, uh, incarnate the meaning with. Yeah, well, there's the the, the old the dictum of, uh, I think, Hume, that you can't get an ought from an is, right? So once you adopt this, uh, this perspective of, uh, say, radical empiricism or something like that or nihilism or whatever— there's no, you can't get any objective is or ought, like you ought to do this. And so it's just a manifestation or version of that same point that uh, if we're all just in a, a meaningless chaotic universe, then uh, there's no preference for one or the other. So, there, there, I mean, literally, there's like, there, everybody should uh, also be able to live uh, or blow themselves up. Like, there's literally no difference between the two whatsoever. Well, yeah, exactly. I was actually talking to a friend of mine who's um, at Oxford and very educated guy, but he, you know, he's, sort of tends to agnosticism and, and scientific empiricism, you know, and so we were having a, I was making an argument for God from, like, from Logos, from the intelligibility of the universe, and he basically reduced it to the point where he was like, well, how do you even know that there are not universes that are unintelligible, right? And so I just, I just said to him, well, okay, I'm going to make a purely utilitarian argument. Uh, if we can't prove anything through sense data, the utilitarian mode is to pretend that we can. Uh, it makes people happier, empirically speaking. Yes. Good point. Yeah. One thing I did want to say too about um, uh, Kabbalah, to be fair to, I read a good bit of Kabbalists and Kabbalistic tradition, and, and I get the impression that, uh, yes, there were Jewish thinkers who wanted to, uh, who were into the black arts and things like this, and they, they took a very occultic view. Uh, but I also don't agree with this idea that uh, that's very popular in a lot of um, you know these kinds of circles that that like all of Kabbalism is this this plan or this plot to destroy Christianity. I don't think that's sensible or coherent because there's a bunch of different Kabbalistic schools. So some of them are more like just Neoplatonists and this like guys who read a bunch of Plato and Plotinus and try to mesh that with their Judaism, right? So I just think that's a more fair approach. Because if you talk to, so if, if some Jewish guy hears this, and if you're if you're approaching this from like a, a apologetic perspective or something, they're they're going to be able to dismantle that argument because if they read say like Nachmanides or somebody like that, they're not going to buy the argument that every every Kabbalist was out to destroy Christianity. Now, <clears throat> that's not me saying that. Kabbalism is good. I just think that it was an attempt of Jewish thought to do a theodicy. That's sure. a big part of it. So, well, it, I mean, I think that the issue is fundamentally. I mean, it's a matter of, you know, I mean, these intellectual constructs are are tools, right? And so, I mean, if you're trying to understand like metaphysics, I mean, you even if you comprehend it, you still have a decision with what to do based on that knowledge. So if you have deep metaphysical understanding, then yeah, you can use that to manipulate the goyim, or you can use that to, you know, try to improve your own virtue. Mm -hmm. Right. Sure. Uh, so we got totally, totally off track. Sure. I guess uh, bringing it back to the Hollywood in question, you know, I want to. Do you? Would you care to like, you know, give a little spiel on the integration of the kind of. Um, like Anglo-Jewish military industrial complex and intelligence apparatus and Hollywood. How is Hollywood used as an organ of the control system generally and what, you know, um, most people are, I mean, most people are just blissfully ignorant. They just kind of, you know, at the, even if they think as Hollywood is Jewish, you know, they think that it's mo mostly motivated by profit. Well, I tend to, uh, I mean, obviously there's a powerful Jewish element in Hollywood, uh, and 
I think I talked to Henrik about this. If you watch that uh, documentary, uh, uh, Jews in Hollywood or Hollywood and the Rise Jews or something like that, Empire of Their Own, <clears throat> it's a famous documentary. Uh, it goes into great depth to chronicle the history of the rise of Jewish filmmakers and how they became prominent in Hollywood. And it's, of course, made by Jews, so it's not uh, anti-Semitic or anything like that. Uh, but what's interesting is that I think that Jews, like any uh, uh, any minority group in America, were seen as outsiders for a long time. So, you know, you had such a dominance of the WASP elite, and especially the East Coast WASP elite, that that any group that was that saw themselves as outsiders, be it black, be it Catholic, be it be it Jew, uh, they were very. Very, uh, very concerned with how to rise up in power structure. And so what we've seen, I think, over the last 100 years is that very thing. And so a lot of the filmmakers who would kind of go on to become the, the heads of the major studios or the early on, like the MGM guys, or who were the, like the, the big five studio heads that were Jewish, eventually they had totally dropped any of their Judaism. So they'd married Gentile wives and they had, you know, changed their names and hidden their identities and stuff like that. And then I think over time, their descendants never cared about Judaism. Many of them, in fact, converted to Catholicism. <laughs> so uh, because they would send their kids to Catholic schools because that's what was like the most you know prominent private school in Hollywood or whatever. So <clears throat> I don't think that it's just as easy as saying that it's like a total uh, like a total Jewish conspiracy, right? But because of that fact, because the realities of people living that way and and dropping their identity, and what I think is, if you watch something like The Godfather, you see this presented for, say, the character of, um, well, actually, each of the generations of the Corleones, is that it's partly about them losing their identity. So they they leave Italy, and they, you know. They think that they're going to come to America for for material progress and monetary pro and then and they do they they he becomes very successful because he learns the system is here very corrupt <laughs> so he rises to the top of you know being the Don and all that and then he Don Corleone passes it on to Michael Corleone and so forth and so and by the third Godfather he's like an international you know, NGO foundation head who's like making land deals for billions of dollars with the Vatican. So the point of that is that he has completely lost his his identity. And part of the third, you know, the, the, the end of the series, part three, is him wanting to go back to Italy to reconnect. So he's done all this. He's made all this money. And what has been the point when all along what he wanted was to go back and if you remember, his wife that he met, his first wife was a, a young Italian girl from his people that a rival mobster blew up, right? So they were married for like a week, and some mob guy blew his wife up. And so he comes back and he marries the, you know, the American girl. And uh, point being that <laughs> everything that Michael wanted his whole life was in Italy. <laughs> right. And, he would have been happier uh, had he not tried to become this billionaire imperial figure. Right? Well, this is something that we talk about. I mean, actually, this brought up, you know, like a bit on the far right circles is that the, you know, all of you have all of these these Jewish intellectuals who push cultural Marxism, but the Jews themselves are actually like imbibing this. And so in the past, there was, I mean, a very explicit, you know, understanding of for thee, not for me, you know, this is for the goyim. But more and more, we're seeing in fact the, that the Jews themselves are, you know, um, like rabbis are releasing all sorts of statements against miscegenation and now breeding with the boyish dogs, right? Well, well yeah, I mean, it, yeah. it kind of makes it makes sense again if you think about it because, uh, I mean, what is the mentality that is, uh, you know, on the bottom of all of this? It's this, you know, Luciferian, uh, yes. right. literal Satanist mentality. So it's not really surprising when it happens to the Jews as well, because, you know, this is what they want all along. I mean, if anything, the Jews who only want to push this on the Goyim and not themselves, uh, <laughs> if anything, they're the ones who is a bit more healthy, so to speak. 
Yeah, I've yeah, I, I, I don't think. Though. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say I've had a conversation with a Jewish friend of mine, uh, and he's actually. It's kind of funny to listen to him talk about this because he'll bash on the reform Jews who are more liberal, and more open, uh, and he'll tell me that you know, oh, like Jewish birth rates are going down because of intermarriage and all this, and you know, I just kind of have to sit back and smile a little bit, like, oh, this is, <laughs> this is, you know, your people doing this essentially, or you know, your elites, I guess. Oh, you've to that. <laughs> well, I, I tend to think that uh, this this strategy is older than, you know, the, the establishment of the state of Israel. In fact, if you look at the McKinder doctrine, uh, it was, it was Halford McKinder's plan that said there would be the establishment of a state of Israel. So I think that the, the, the Rothschild level uh, persons, they have absolutely no concern for Jews. <laughs> I don't think that. They, no, no, I clearly don't. Clearly not yeah. beyond any. Pra they, I mean, they're pragmatic about it, right? They utilize yeah. the yes. the ethnic ca Kabbalistic infrastructure to, you know, for their own advantage. But they are perfectly willing to throw everybody else under the bus. Yeah, I mean, Spengler, Spengler essentially said that Jews and Anglos are essentially the same, and that's why a person like the Israeli could actually become prime minister in uh, in uh, in the UK. Right. I actually, I want to get into. We, I want to get into this discussion, the Anglo question and the Jewish question, back to back. But I want to just finish up here on esoteric Hollywood a little bit. Yeah. So one of the things is like. Oh, you uh, real quick before you go on. I sure I didn't really. So I never did get to the point you asked about propaganda and what. So what right. I think really the long term picture of the propaganda is. The creation of a global culture, and so Hollywood is a powerful means to export. Americanism, really, and I, I view Americanism as kind of globalism beta, and then America as the melting pot, as the new world order, as the uh, you know foundation of the pyramid, the, the block of the of the uh, capitalist pyramid, is the means by which the world would be evangelized for globalism and the monoculture. And so, <clears throat> I think that's what we're seeing now is the exportation of Americanism, and that would be consumerism and. Uh, porn and Marilyn Manson and everything like that to the rest of the world, and uh, you know, vaccines and and GMOs and all this gobbledygook garbage from the the big foundations and whatnot. And by the way, a lot of that's in Israel too. So I think that it's very it's difficult to say that it's like a total Jewish conspiracy because uh, you know I mean abortion, abortion is legal in uh, in Israel. So well, it has one so, of the largest gay pride gay pride say, parades yeah, every year. Tel Aviv is like a huge uh, gay gay capital. So, yeah, it's said to be one of the, like the gayest cities on earth. I've heard <laughs> that before. Uh, so, so Hollywood functions as a means to to create a global culture, uh, and then a monoculture, and then you you get these weird aberrations of Bollywood and like other countries try to do the same thing, and then what they'll do is export. Bollywood to America. They'll export those cultures here, right? And so you'll get anime becomes popular in America. Ah, uh, yes. You see, so <laughs> yeah. it, what, this is all this is all this exchange, which is, to a degree, it's just a normal aspect of the cosmopolitan theory, yeah. right? Or, or the market, uh, you know, merchant sea power, right? As opposed to the land power. Uh, so part of that is just the, the natural progress of monetarism and capitalism and so forth. But th I think there's also a deeper sinister aspect of it, too. I mean, we see this with the big propaganda films like American Sniper or Zero Dark Thirty uh, uh, or even things like Transformers, which you may not think about it, but uh, actually was made in consultation with the Pentagon. And so wow. even something... Yeah. Yeah, Michael Bay movies are, are oftentimes made in, in concert with the Pentagon. And you say, why would that be? Well, who are the heroes of that movie? Well, the Transformers work together with the U.S. military, the good side of the U.S. military. Right? I mean, there might be bad guys in the deep state, like the uh, John Turturro character or something like that. Uh, but, uh, yeah, there's you can find articles, uh, mainstream articles about the, the Pentagon working to help uh, make Transformers. So this oh, is very – yeah, this is very. You common. know, it's, uh, you were saying the other day on, on one of these podcasts, like the Pentagon had donated to Cupcake Wars. Yes, uh, 
uh, Tom Secker, who works with uh, Sibel, got a FOIA request for, uh, for what the Pentagon's budget was for Hollywood like two years ago. Uh, and they had donated, uh, put in a good bit of money to Cupcake Wars. Yeah. Many of the TV cooks have been uh, spies. <laughs> I know, I know yeah, Anthony means. Bourdain, right? Yeah. I'm not positive. Oh, Julia Bourdain, Child. Think, yeah, Julia Child was, but I don't know. Yeah. Bourdain, I think, is very likely. In, uh, so what you come to see is that a lot of these people are, you know, they're promoted and they're, they're, they're making this money because they're, they're agents of the, of the state, which people may not know, right? Right. Wow. Fascinating. So the next subject I learned everything. Is, right. Is uh, like full spectrum dominance. I mean, in more, I want to talk about predictive programming. So this is one of the things, especially that a lot of the people on the far right are incredulous of is even if they recognize that Hollywood has like a clear culture forming agenda, like they'll reject the idea that Hollywood will condition people to accept certain ideas before they occur. And so right. one of the famous ones is like, you know, 9-11, right? You can see all huge swaths and swaths and swaths of these like 9-11 destruction of the Twin Tower references. Um, right. Right. You know, and so the people ask, you know, people just will just actually dismiss this out of hand. Well, I just think that's kind of a unfair attitude. When you study the relationship of the Pentagon and the intelligence agencies to Hollywood, which I've done for a long time. Uh, you, you, it becomes a lot more plausible <laughs> after you've studied that for a long time and a lot, a lot easier to believe that. Um, if you've not studied that, which most people haven't, I totally understand that it would seem bizarre. It would seem crazy. And maybe 10 years ago when I first got familiar with the idea of the relationship between Hollywood and the CIA and stuff like that, it, it, even to me, I remember in my 20s when I first encountered this, although this is very strange. Like what? I, I I thought it would be. I, if I talked to myself ten years ago, the, the Jay that I am now, I would think I was nuts. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? There's not all. It's not that conspiratorial, but it is. And you can find studies that talk about a lot of this stuff. So you can find studies that that go very very deep, very scientific uh, into the process of how to condition people through film and through the movie theater experience. Uh, so let's take something like Disneyland or Epcot. Epcot is, is not just a money-making scheme. Epcot was the older form of conditioning people to the acceptance of planned communities, uh, smart grids, smart cities, uh, and Agenda 21 type ideas. Now, I'm not saying by that that I'm like a libertarian and I think that there's no such thing as a city planning or anything like that. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that the, the Club of Rome style approach to this stuff uh, that Disney and Epcot was conditioning people for is not healthy. That's not healthy civilization or anything like well, that. Well, and we can actually see like, historical, historical examples of this. I mean, like St. Petersburg. Um, you know, St. Petersburg was completely like a Masonic city. It literally oh, yeah. was built on the Gnostic idea of, you know, the floating city in the clouds, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it was, and, you know, Peter the Great, of you know, Raphael Johnson talks about this, was like literally a Satanist. Um, right. You know, he was a very high level Freemason. And, you know, we know what he did, of course, to the church in Russia. He com completely tried to destroy it. And he right. built that city on the backs of like 250,000 Cossacks. He killed, he, he 250,000 yes. of them died dredging the swamps. Yeah. Right. So there, there's city planning in itself is neither bad nor good. It could be either one. Uh, and a lot of city planners are, are Masons. Go look, go to Washington, D.C. So you're absolutely right about that. And I think uh, when I interviewed Dr. Johnson, we did we did touch on that. But but uh, we can see this in America, too, again, with Disney and Epcot. And all you have to do is just look into the history of Epcot and the Pentagon. Uh, the Pentagon has always been interested in Disneyland and and studying it because it's a closed plan community. Theme parks, things like this. Now, I know that sounds crazy, but that's if you think from the perspective of a nefarious Pentagon planner or, or from a, a corporate planner, <laughs> it makes perfect sense because you want to understand human psychology, motivations, 
uh, managerial theories, uh, the creation of the company man and this kind of stuff out of the, the 40s and 50s that the CIA and the advertising companies were studying. All that stuff is real. So, so Disney is just an example of the intersection of the deep state interests, corporate interests, monopoly capital in interests, Hollywood interests, creative interests, right? All of these intersect there. And so I just use that as one example of predictive programming that most people don't think about. But what is Epcot? It's been it's been preparing you for a surveillance society, for a smart city, for all these things that we now see being implemented. So that's predictive programming right in your face. And everybody's been to Disneyland probably <laughs> in America at least. Uh, I don't. Maybe you guys aren't familiar with that. Like, and if no, I've been to Disney World. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so you've seen this kind of stuff, right? Well, yeah, and no, and I, I mean, it's I, interesting. It's that it's it's actually quite overt. I mean, and even in the when it was first created, like that's how it was directly marketed as this kind of city of the future, right? Right, and now that doesn't may, now maybe Walt himself was not nefarious or some. I mean, I'm not trying to say that. Every, I'm not trying to paint this in some simplistic moralistic thing of, you know, like they're all Luciferians and they're all. It, it, it's not, it doesn't really work that way. It's people are, are planning based on the worldview that they have in their age, in their day. Yeah. And so there was a lot of people in the 40s and 50s who bought into World War II propaganda and the Cold War, you know, and they, they I mean, I, I speak this way about Ian Fleming a lot. I don't think that he was all good or all bad because people ask me that all the time. We talk about, you know, was he a good guy or a bad guy? Well, I mean, Depends on what you mean. Yeah, I listened uh, to your he, uh, interview with Richard Spencer. It was pretty good. Okay, yeah, I mean, he's, he's a man of his time. So anyway, predictive programming is most easily proven by things like uh, Bond novels, where you have a transition from the Cold War to the War on Terror decades ahead of time in Fleming's novels with Smirsch, Spectre. Uh, predictive programming is demonstrated again in things like the pilot of the lone gunman, where you have the remote controlled jets being flown in uh, remote uh, hijacked remote controlled uh, planes being flown into the towers. By the way, you yes, say, well, uh, you say well, how he, well, what will well, Dean Hagland uh, did an interview with Alex Jones about 10 years ago where he said, that the CIA was there on the set telling us what things they would like to have in in the script. So I think that that's the most reasonable thesis for <laughs> for how you could ha <clears throat> have the the events of 9-11, you know, ahead of time in so many fictional accounts. Uh, there's an Iron Man cartoon from the 90s, which has both the towers being destroyed and a plane flying into the Pentagon. Uh, again, in like 1995, the old Iron Man cartoon. And this, I've had this on my website for, I don't know, six years. I mean, I don't think that's accidental, especially not when you look into even children's cartoons, right? So if the CIA is interested in cooking shows because they're interested in culture and culture creation and cooking and food is obviously a big part of culture – uh, they're probably interested in cartoons. And then when you look into people who have consulted on cartoon shows like G.I. Joe and the, the Friedman character that I've talked about for, you know, on many podcasts, actually I found an interview with him that I dug up where he talks about, he talks about his consultations on cartoons. Yeah, here it is. It's called, uh, he killed Optimus Prime, an interview with Ron Friedman, the writer of Transformers. And he is a uh, – he's an architect and a teacher from Chapman University. So when you go back and you watch these cartoons from the 80s like uh, G.I. Joe and Transformers and whatnot, they'll have all these very strange things that we 20, 30 years later find out are real embedded in them. Right. Now, would I be remiss in asking if that name echoes? If what? Uh, are you familiar with the uh, parentheses, the echo meme? Uh, no. What? What is that? Uh, if you if a gentleman's name has per three parentheses around it, or you pronounce it with an echo, it means that he's Jewish. Oh. Okay. So we would say Friedman, <laughs> man, et cetera. Okay. Anyway, there is there is one thing that I want to ask before. Um, 
And that's, I remember seeing an article, I think it was from CNN or something a while back. And this was on their actual website. It was still on the actual official CSN, CNN website or NBC, whatever American newspaper it was. And this was from September the 10th, 2001. And this was about literally saying that the Israelis could launch a false flag against, uh, for example, the Twin Towers to drag America into uh, into a war. And I, I tried to see, you know, if this was on fake websites, and it wasn't. Now, I lost that link uh, when my uh, computer crashed uh, a year or so ago, but it, it was really, really eerie. I mean, you see such a thing on, you know, such a big website, and it's, you know, the day before as well. It's just insane. Hans, well, his conspiracy theories, what are you trying to prove? Come on, this upsets my simple <laughs> utilitarian worldview. Uh, okay, clearly, I mean, we, we don't like Muslims, and if Muslims did 9-11, that's a good reason to not like Muslims. So please, Hans, okay, we don't need to talk about the truth. Okay. Well, I mean, it just fits into the narrative of clash of civilizations, of, of pitting Western so-called Christianity against uh, against Islam. And, right, I mean, and how, that's something I want to talk how, about if we get, we get time. Have, yeah, how long have Bernard Lewis and Sam Huntington been talking about this? And uh, hint, hint, that, that suggests to me that there might be a, a bigger game at play here to wipe mm -hmm. out those two, two views. Uh, and then, oh, by the way, I wanted to mention too that there, there are other. If you wanted to really take on the the issue of predictive programming, uh, that is just a term that has been used by you conspiracy people for a while. But it's already been taken on by like academics many times over. So there's, you can uh, get other academic publications like the CIA and Hollywood out of University of Texas Press by uh, Tricia Jenkins, where she deals with it, and the CIA consulting on J.J. Abrams productions and alias and things like that. Uh, there's a book called Operation Hollywood, How the Pentagon Shapes and Censors the Movies by David Robb. Uh, ma there's many other examples of this other than my book. There's uh, Ian Fleming's Secret, Secret War by Craig Cobble that goes into a lot of the Bond stuff. So. Yeah, all of this has already been dealt with. It's just that the, the like the public doesn't live in, you know, academia world, so they don't know any of this stuff. Right. Um, yeah, there was something, you know, I'm interested in the links between British intelligence and the rise of um, Salafism. Um, but that's something, you know, that's kind of ancillary, maybe for another show, another day. Well, so I can tell you two good books on that would be sure. uh, Mark, Let's hear it. Uh, Mark, Mark Curtis, who's a Royal Society researcher fellow, Secret Affairs. That's a really good book. I, okay. read, that, I read that several years ago, about 500 pages on this topic. <laughs> oh. um, you can read also Robert Dreyfus's book, Devil's Game, which is dedicated right. to this topic. I did a whole talk on that book. And then um, Ingdahl's, Ingdahl's a little, a little on the left, but his... Uh, Lost Hegemon uh, that he just did is uh, dedicated to that. Interesting. It's fa fascinating. So, um, and if you if you if you want the 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 master tome that will take you forever to read, uh, Stephen Dorrell's MI6. Okay. Is that the authorized history or? No, he's a. Uh, British professor of University of I forgot what we I exchanged a couple of emails with him but um, it's just he's just a, uh, a professor of the history of espionage at, at some uh, UK university I don't remember what hmm. fascinating uh, so the the what I wanted to discuss with you and this is something I think is absolutely critical is so I listened to all of your um, tragedy and hope lectures. Yeah, uh, and I thought that they were number one. I want to say thank you for actually reading through that very dry tome and kind of distilling the the, the good bits for us. You're really a lot of work. public service. Yeah, <laughs> it was a lot of work. Yeah, so you know, God bless you for that. Um, but the second thing is that I think um, that that book is is really so critical to get an understanding of how the oligarchs use financial instruments in order to shape world history, how to create false dialectics, how geopolitics actually 
works, especially, you know, because he's giving you the, the CFR inside man view. Um, but one of the things that I, it stands out is like on the far right, we talk a lot about the Jews, right? Um, and obviously, this is something that's, you know, a lot of this is, is reactionary because you're not allowed to talk about the Jews in the mainstream. This is the cardinal sin. Hitler is the secular de uh, devil, right? Um, and so, but what happens is it seems that a lot of people will kind of narrow in on the Jews, you know, as exclusively the synagogue of Satan, and then they will completely, you know, exclude the possibility that there's any, you know, Protestants or Goyim that are, you know, at a similar level of control uh, or similar interests or mechanisms of operation, you know, beyond just being kind of Shabbos Goys. So I wanted to talk about the Anglo question and the Jewish question. Right. Well, Specifically, I'm, go on. Yeah, I'm, I'm an Anglo, so I guess I can speak <laughs> from Drew. <sighs> wow. Uh, we're going to have to hang up now, Jay. Clearly, yep. you're a shill. A self-hating Anglo. <laughs> self-hating Anglo. Uh, <laughs> uh, my, well, my background is uh, the Dyers. The Dyers, actually, I think they were given the licensure by the crown to tend the royal swans. <laughs> So, so my uh, predecessors, I guess, actually they come up in Burke's Peerage quite a bit uh, as as the tenders of the royal swans. So they have the, the swan uppers license, and I assume that's my descendants. I don't I don't know for sure, obviously. Uh, and well, of course, dyers. There were many Jews who were dyers in London, so I, there may be a Jewish pedigree. I don't know. I guess I'll have to get my DNA tested and see if I can make the cut or something ridiculous like that. Well, but, you know, you realize that if you're not 100% pure Aryan phenotype, we're going to put you in the gas chamber. Well, see, but I have blue eyes, so I don't, does that count or does it? Ah, uh, well, uh, you know, are they Ashkenazi eyes? I mean, <laughs> you know. Yeah, <laughs> he can still be an Edomite, so. No. Yeah, that's the thing is, Jay, you know, you might not be part of the Edemic race. You might be some sort of Edomite mongrel. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. so uh, on the other side, it's Scottish, and we come from, uh, like, noble Scottish clans, so I don't know. Well, but Celts aren't white, you see, Jay, so that's, that's not going to fly either. Yes, okay. but uh, Anglo question. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, all joking aside, yeah, of course, so are we. we well, have, I, but... I think that this is, a lot of this stuff is very, like I've, I've read a lot of, on Judaism and Jewish theology and so forth and Jewish views of race and racial theory. And I don't get the impression that there's like one unified Jewish view of, of what exactly constitutes their position because obviously they've accepted converts too so uh but at the same time you have elements of uh jewish belief that it, that it's very racial so they will sometimes themselves discriminate against sephardic so it's it's very confusing and i don't i don't know exactly what's going on there and they have a left and a right and conservative and all that and the Likud and all and so forth so I don't know. I mean, I, I and I, one of the reasons I don't touch on like the Palestinian Zionist issue is because number one, I don't know much about this this whole issue other than what I hear on internet arguments and debates, and a lot of the people that I see, for example, championing the Palestinian issue, uh, they're big like UN promoters, and they're always tied to this left stuff. So I don't know. To me, that seems I, I'm not. I'm not too impressed with that stuff. Well, I think it's a, it's like one of the truest manifestations of the false dialectic. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but now, so uh, the Anglo question, yeah, this is an interesting question because there's a lot of uh, different theories. Well, one other thing I wanted to say too is I saw a book saying, there was a book put out that uh, they were arguing that it was a couple of years ago, like a, some scholarly approach. And it was saying that, that all the Scots, like the Scottish people are actually like the lost Jewish tribe, you know, like one of the lost tribes. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, exactly. no. I mean, don't you know the Danes? The, yeah, see, the Danes come from the tribe of Dan. Yeah, I'm, I'm certain the Christian identity people are going to fucking murder us for even just joking about it. But yeah. Well, uh, identity is a code word for empty whites. Anyway, so the. The question of the Anglo relationship is interesting because, you know, most people, I, I, what I think probably is relatively true is the intermarriage of, you know, Jew, Jewish people in England were able to rise up pretty prominently. And so they, 
did you know intermarry into uh, the upper class eventually and the moneyed class and so forth so you know, there's been this long presence of of Jewish power uh, in England so it's very hard to parcel that out and distinguish it and I don't know that anybody has like some real I think that a lot of times we think we know everything that's going on or we but a lot of this stuff we don't really know so like you know the questions of origins like we don't know who the fuck <laughs> the original what happened to the tribe of Dan now maybe somebody will figure it out I'm not saying it's not possible but a lot of this stuff is theory is what I'm trying to say so um I forgot where we're going with this. So, can we talk about Anglo power? Well, I hope so. Right. Because I guess the, what, what I'm basically Quigley, trying to say is that Quigley, you know, look, here, here's what Quigley says. He says right. that there was an alliance between Catholic, Protestant, and Jewish banking eventually in different countries, and that that he argues that it was hand, in the in the West. It ultimately was transferred into the hands of J.P. Morgan and the Rockefellers. So. Uh, does I, now I'm not saying that the Rothschilds don't have vast power and interest. Obviously they do, but I just tend to think that at that level, uh, the Rothschilds don't care about nation states and they don't care about who's I, what your identity is because just like David Rockefeller or uh, you know the head J.P. Morgan and these people, they're not they're not ideologically bound because to be in that role you can't be. You have to be completely pragmatic. I would argue. Uh, so I tend to think that they just all agree on their atheism slash pragmatism slash Luciferianism. <laughs> and so right. yeah. they're all kind of on the same page. Well, yeah, I mean, our Lord says like, this quite, uh, I mean, our Lord says this quite directly, you know, to the Pharisees that you, know, you are the sons of Satan because you do his work. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I mean, this really is the constant you see everywhere in these people. I mean, even a person who joins, uh, let's say, a Freemasonic lodge because he wants contacts and want, you know, a career advancement, then he thinks he's, you know, one of these, you know, uh, in-group clubs that, you know, gives favor to each Even that mentality is in in and of itself the same, you know, atheistic pragmatic mentality. It's just yes. to a very lesser right. degree. Yeah. So you could say that even these people are without realizing it. They, they have the same Masonic mentality. That's a good point. Absolutely, yeah. Will you will you do what it takes to get Mammon? Yeah, exactly. Right. Did you want to add something here, Spice? Yeah, I was just going to say it's like uh, we were talking about an earlier episode, kind of related, where some people in conspiracy circles will allege that oh, America's run secretly by a bunch of Nazis because. People on Wall Street like Bill Donovan and people in the British establishment help fund the Nazis, then therefore we were ruled by like a secret Nazi government. Well, no, that doesn't necessarily follow. They're just working with them as a business partner to achieve their own ends. That doesn't mean right. they're, you know, committed. Well, the Dulles you have factions in the CIA and the establishment too. So some factions do support and there's like five or six different views of of or, or sects within the quote CIA. So you've got like Robert Baer style Democratic <laughs> Party stuff. Uh, and then you've also got like Alan Dulles, uh, you know, crypto Nazi type stuff. So, I mean, human beings differ and have different views. But like you said, yeah, at a geopolitical level, that doesn't mean that people won't work together. I mean, Reinhard Galen trained the Mossad. So. Yeah, and then, right. if, you know, like the CIA helped fund, uh, was it Betty, Betty Friedan or Gloria Steinem, one of them, you know, like helping them fund Ms. Magazine. So <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if Nazis well, like, were so, feminists. So like if you go, I, I wrote an article that I think is relevant probably. If you go back, it's called uh, the OSS, CIA, OSS, and Western Support for Communism, something like that. I wrote it three or four years ago, but... Uh, I, I went to the CFR archives, and you can find back in the 40s they were having these debates. So you had uh, some of the people in the CIA were more on the Nazi side of things, and they wanted a, a pro-Nazi approach. They wanted to um, – they wanted fascism. They wanted that kind of a, of, a, of a government enacted. 
And they didn't want this idea of convergence with the Soviet Union. And so you had other people in the CFR who were more on the liberal side, uh, Alger Hiss and these kinds of people, and they were more openly wanting a convergence between Sovietism and Western capitalism, which, you know, the third wave view, as it's called. Uh, so there's debates at those levels as well. So, you know, don't, I'm not trying to say that it's all one total control mechanism because there are different views, different strategies, and different plans. Um, but I tend to believe, in the, when it comes to Hitler, for example, I tend to believe the the, the way that Quigley phrases it is that uh, he was unwittingly, perhaps, uh, a, a puppet of the of the British uh, power structure. Right. That's something that I'm actually very interested in discussing, and we'll get to that a little bit later on. But we have to go to the break soon, so I want to kind of get back to this Anglo question. Yeah. I mean, if you look at this historically, I mean, if you go all the way back to the Roman Republic, there are records of, you know, Jewish and Syrian merchants all over the Mediterranean in southern France. Mm -hmm. um, so they've been, literally have been international merchants for 2,500 years. Um, I mean, you could argue that's exactly what happened with King Solomon is, is that he engaged in foreign trade deals, basically, uh, and accepted the idols in his temple. Um, and so, but it, it seems like, especially after, you know, um, the conversion of the Roman Empire to Christianity, there seemed to have always been this natural check on Jewish power. Um, usury was considered to be gravely sinful, you know, and illegal, and, you know, Jews were always seen with, you know, suspicion. I mean, St. John Chrysostom, of course, writes versus Judaeus. And so, I mean, even in the high Middle Ages, you know, um, you know, with the crystallization of the errors of papis papism, there was always this natural check on Jewish power. Whenever they would accrue, you know, too much land through usury, you know, they would just be expelled and their lands reconfiscated, and you know, things would kind of have a reset. But it seems that you know what happened is in the Renaissance with the rise in, in terms of the Catholic circles, the Medici banking family. And then with the Protestant Reformation, John Calvin, of course, the Usuris, where he defends usury among Christians, right? Um, mm -hmm. There is this, uh, the, those, those safeguards drop. And suddenly it becomes acceptable for Christians to engage in usurious business practices with Jews. And the kind of, you know, arch, the, the carriers of this torch seem to be, you know, the Netherlands and um, England. Right. And so my kind of view well, would be that these the Anglo question having to deal with the you know embracing of, of Protestantism sort of led the way for this inordinate Jewish influence that we see today. Well, I don't think any of that could have happened if the papacy didn't change its view on usury in the West. <laughs> so Oh, I'm not familiar with this. Do you care to enlighten us? Uh, yeah, the Catholic Church uh, around that time, you're talking about the Medici period, the Renaissance period, uh, formerly had forbade the practice and then uh, began to to change and say that it was uh, it was it was do it was doable. Uh, I think Michael Hoffman even has a whole book on this. So absolutely. In fact, when I was a Catholic, I had a hard time trying to sort of wrangle with that. Uh, but now argue they certain arguments are, are, are made at times like, well, could a Christian charge a non-Christian usury? Uh, you know, these kinds of weird sort of uh, pro approaches to it. And then, anyway, I'm not, uh, it's, that's a very uh, complex involved issue, but just simply put, um, yeah, it's a dangerous thing and it's very, it can be very harmful uh, and it is a tool but I, I would say that it, that you'd have to the, – the first power structure in the West that begins to allow it is the papacy. Wow. Fascinating. Yeah. And so but would you generally agree with the narrative that I've presented that it was like fundamentally a problem with Western Christianity that we allowed this inordinate Jewish money to power to come in? Yeah, well, yeah, what I'm saying is I guess it would be wh whichever pope, and it, it, I haven't looked at this in a long time, so I can't remember off the top of my head, which, which it's, some, it's something during the Renaissance period, there's a change in papal approach. So 
Yeah, there's a talk so, uh, Hoffman did on Red Ice, I think it was. It's from several years ago, but he talks about um, it was kind of like a process starting yeah. I think with the Council of Trent. I don't remember all the details, but it's, yeah, it was like a, it took like a couple centuries or something. Well, yes, yeah, that's right. That's I right. I think we also need uh, to briefly just, just uh, show why usury is so destructive that it is. I mean, what is usury in its essence? You give someone money and you expect more money back. What will this extra money come from? I mean, you got to convert something to shekels. So what this is doing, it's like the, this will to power in the form of, uh, you know, usury, crushing that which is organic. So if you have maybe some fields, you have to sell some of your land to, to pay the usury, the, the, the money exchanger, or someone else has to do it instead. Well, At best, you can just shift, shift the, the blame, so to speak. And... Let me just take a modern example of this. In, in Sweden, we have uh, the, the whole pension system as a huge pyramid scheme. So what they have been doing now for years is that they, they have uh, redistributed money, so we are all equal, so we are all good consumers, so we keep feeding the system, so to speak. And they also get all these uh, money people from the third world in, so they can do the same thing with them. We pay for their uh, clothes, we pay for their rent, we pay for all of this. Plus, they will then let, um, take money from the bank in loans, so they'll stimulate the economy. So the whole uh, economic wheel will just uh, speed up, speed up, speed up, until it hopefully crashes soon. And that is what we see right now. It's literally sucking a nation dry. Right. I mean, I think the, the, to, to say it in a, in a more pithy way, I mean, E. Michael Jones describes it as barren metal. Right. So essentially, it's the artificial creation of liquid capital where there's no like real capital to back it up. So it's there's not any goods or services that are being provided to expect this increase in in money, in money capital. It's just well, kind of art, artificially demanded. Yeah, I understand all that. And I mean, I, I, I'm familiar with those arguments, but and I think that like now where we are, it's almost. Uh, we were so dominated by this electronic fiat Federal Reserve type stuff, which did have its origins in, in usury and gold notes. And then, you know, like printing more gold notes than you had actual gold and all that. I mean, that's what Quigley goes into. And that's the irony, of course, of the libertarians is that they'll talk all day about tragedy and hope in Quigley, but uh, they forget that Quigley says that the gold backed currency and the libertarian philosophies of the 1700s that that's all the the banker plot <laughs> so uh i'd love to hear uh ron paul respond to at some point to carol quigley talking about ron paul's philosophy being the <laughs> beta version of the the uh, banker plot and then now we live in banker plot 2.0 with uh, you know digital currencies and all this kind of stuff anyway but i don't know i mean i think that at a local level you could make an argument that I guess it depends on how you define usury because, for example, if if I have um, if I have a, a lot of capital or if I own something and someone comes to me with a business venture and they want to they want to borrow or or they want they want money, I'm taking a risk by, by giving them the, the money for whatever their venture is. Now, if it's charity, that's something different. But if they're wanting to start a business or something like that, then, then I'm participating in the risk of this. And I don't think that you could use Christian charity to argue that like I'm somehow bound to have to help somebody start a business or something. I'm not bound by that. So uh, now some people will define this as the most basic example of usury that that if i expect a return for the money that somebody borrows for me for some business venture most people what i think say that that's like basic usury i mean i don't i'm not sure i have a, a problem with that i don't see why it would be wrong for somebody to you know to expect i would tend fair, to agree with you i mean I think obviously i think i know i think that you're correct and i mean when you when you give out a loan at risk you're providing a service that has a real like quantifiable Yes. You know, now, market we're value. About, we're talking about something else, though. Obviously, when we're talking about like these giant international banks and Ponzi schemes yeah. and all that, that's obviously a total scam. And so it's kind of, you know, it's not. 
One of the things I've been thinking, here's, here's what I'll say to this. One of the things I've been thinking about lately is, and I have a very high view of the Old Testament law, uh, which I know Dr. Johnson does as well. Um, so biblical law, for example, I think can still inform a lot of uh, our practice and approach to the world nowadays. And I kind of come out of a, a theonomic a tradition when I was a Yeah, we're familiar. We actually had a gentleman on that we were going to discuss that with, but yeah, no, go on. I'm familiar. Yeah, well, I was, I was a hardcore uh, Reconstructionist theonomist for a long time, so a, a lot of those principles I still apply, and I think if you look at something like, you know, the Code of Justinian, you'll see some of those basic principles applied in, in Justinian's law as well, so uh, I think that it's very, obviously very true with orthodoxies, you know, if you read uh, St. Philorat or somebody like that, Philorat of Moscow, he'll talk about Christian principles in government and so forth. So anyway, um, so but some of these areas are very difficult, very very fuzzy. And uh, I would I would so if you if you look at the example of Solomon, and I don't think Solomon was, was totally a bad guy. I think that for the most part he was a good guy until his until his latter days of uh, you know falling into idolatry and so forth. But we get a lot of good stuff from Solomon, particularly if you look at the story of the the woman, the, the two whores with uh, fighting over the baby. Okay, so when Solomon's going to apply the law to this case, there's no specific example of like a penal sanction or a case law that tells Solomon what to do in this case. So Solomon, in his wisdom, right, applies a principle to the situation and resolves it. And he's, of course, lauded in scripture for his wisdom in this case, right? And so he tells. He says he's going to cut the baby in half, if you recall, right? And then uh, he knows that the the real mother of the disputed child, the illegitimate child, is going to allow the other one to have it because if she really loves her child, she's not going to want the baby to be cut in half, and she would rather the child be with another person if it's a lie. Right. Yeah. So what I'm getting at here is that <clears throat> one thing I've noticed and, and been thinking about as I studied Christology intently over the last 10 years is that Christology really informs— everything. And what we have in Christology is everything that's that's in the realm of the human uh, is deified, right? Because the human nature of Christ is joined to the divine nature, and the energies of the divine nature deify the human. And that would in include human reason. So human reason, in even in aspects of law, uh, requires deification. So... Um, what I'm saying is that what you see in that case is Solomon, because he has the Holy Spirit, his reasoning faculties are deified. So he's able to apply divine wisdom to that case. And I think that that's the kind of ideology and, and approach that we should have in our day too to government is that, you know, some of these cases are going to be case by case basis. They're going to right. require human reason. And obviously we're not dealing with anything like that now. We're so far down the toilet, but Mm -hmm. You know, who, who knows who might be listening? Well, of, of course, podcast. of course. Well, that's, in uh, fact, that's exactly what we, I hear it. 500 years from now, somebody might be listening to this podcast. <laughs> it's true. It's true. I'm serious. No, it is. It's very possible, right? If the yeah. eschaton does not arrive first. But that's what you described is exactly kind of what, what we're about here at Mysterium is, you know, we look at ourselves as, I mean, essentially, um, like logos fascism, and so we see. We're going to talk about this like later on, but we see, you know, when we talk about fascism or na small NS national socialism, what we're really talking about is the, you know, application of divine law manifest in the logos, the person of Jesus Christ, to our contemporary situation, and we think that these are the best bywords to describe that particular political philosophy. You know, anyway, but that's uh, something that we're going to get into. We've gone past our time, so we're going to go uh, ahead and have a break, and then we'll come back in the second segment, and we'll talk about uh, conspiracy culture, racist liberalism, theology, and maybe some Kali Yuga news. So stay tuned. Okay.
Welcome back to Mysterium Fasci's episode 15, part two. So before the break, we covered an incredibly broad range of subjects. Um, and now we're going to talk about a couple of different things. I think that what we'll begin with is, hmm, I think what we'll discuss is, a, uh, we'll touch a little bit on conspiracy culture, and then we'll talk a little bit about racist liberalism. So one of the very, uh, one of the things we talked about this, the alt-right, is that there has been a complete kind of failure to produce a cogent worldview. That's because a lot of the people in the alt-right do not share the same worldview. They're what we would call racist liberals. They're not traditionalists. But we're going to get into that a little bit later. And so, Jay, I think that you were perfectly correct when there was the shooting in Texas. You went on Red Ice and you kind of critiqued the alt-right for you know, accepting the mainstream narrative. And we talked about this before. Um, are, do you know what – are you familiar with TRS, the right stuff biz? Uh, I've heard of it, yeah. Right. Well, we we used to be at the right stuff biz, and you know, Spies and myself, you know, we were critiqued basically for questioning the mainstream narrative. Yeah, I I used to always get uh, a lot of problems because I would bring up you know like nine eleven as you know not being as being bullshit basically, or the official story being bullshit, you know, mm -hmm. um, and you know you you can lay out the evidence, you can show like the like Corbett's 9-11 in five minutes, which I think is, you know, a great video. Um, mm -hmm. And then you get attacked like, oh, this is just crazy talk. Why would they do this? But then the same people attacking you will turn right around and show, explain to you paragraph by paragraph how the Holocaust is a total exactly. Right. And, you know, so <laughs> you're not really being consistent. In your... Yeah, we don't like conspiracy theories, but we're definitely it's okay to question the Holocaust, right? Yeah. And but that's the thing is we see this also in conspiracy culture, you get the exact opposite, where everything is on the table, but if you deny the Holocaust, you know, or you even engage in revisionism, right? About the like death figures, right? Gas chambers, that sort of stuff. That's 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 beyond the pale. So well, I mean every, really everything everything is unfortunately stuck within some very broad uh, thing that you're supposed to be labeled as like so you know there's only supposed to be like three or four options here and that's really ridiculous because life isn't boiled down to three or four options of uh, oh are you a liberal are you uh, a Ron Paul Tea Party guy or are you all right I mean there's like other th options in the world <laughs> there's not just these three or four Right. But everything is so dumbed down that, you know, it's if you try to what, what I try to do, if you try to take things on a case by case basis to look at each individual thing and, and try to understand it on its own merits and whatnot. Uh, I mean, that's just that people are so. That's so far outside of the norm that it's it is very difficult, so. Right. Well, and in I other, think in other words, in a... other words, I should be able to investigate 9-11 uh apart it has nothing that has nothing to do with uh what the alt right majority view of 911 is right i mean what happened on 911 is in no way should be connected to or is not determined by uh you know richard spencer's view of 911 uh and right. i obviously i disagree with richard spencer on 911 so yeah and i think that the problem is with the alt right is that there's not um there's not an agreement on the worldview, and that's really the most important thing. I mean, if you if you agree on core metaphysical principles, then you can diverge in terms of the application of those principles to a particular situation. Yeah, right, right. And, you know, I, I understand Richard and, and Andy's uh, approach to a, a broad coalition, and, and, you know, Dugan talks about a broad coalition of anti-liberals, and I—, I I don't have a problem with that idea, given 
the dangers of Western materialism and and, and uh, liberalism and so forth. But you know, I mean, there's going to be inter Nicene debates within these camps, and it's just a natural process. And I, I think that over time, I really do believe the truth wins out. So, you know, I'm not I'm not too worried about it. Right. Well, that's something that we're kind of big on here is that we just talk about, you know, I just kind of get to the heart of the matter is what we see as the fundamentally like the most important thing is not really ideology, but it's theology. I mean, yes. it's your core metaphysical principles, the, the things that you believe about the highest echelon of reality that ultimately end up affecting your entire yes. worldview and the way you behave in everyday life. Yes. And so what's important for us, and what we emphasize again and again and again, is that it's this worldview that's critical. Are you, are you a traditionalist in the real sense? Do you reject the modern world? And that's what we see as the critical thing. And so, you know, there are lots of people, and so, you know, we, we feel that when we say, you know, small NS national socialism, that this is the most appropriate way to describe um, a total rejection of the modern world. However, obviously, there's some you know issues with that. You know, obviously, um, you know, fascism was a was a explicitly modernist movement, right? Um, right? National socialism, in many senses, was explicitly a modernist movement. You know, but we also see emanations of this, like with Codrianu in Romania, the Iron Guard, that was you know one devoutly orthodox, uh, and did actually agree with us on all of these metaphysical issues. So. <laughs> Well, I tend to agree with, uh, you know, just sort of the, the basic uh, monarchic principle or right. the uh, you know, Byzantine principle of symphonia. So mm -hmm. you know, that's my view. Well, I tend to agree. And I mean, that's the thing is before, are you familiar with like neo-reaction? Uh, I think so. Yeah, well, there, there was a movement that kind of was sparked on the internet that kind of got me into this whole political scene, which was kind of neo-reaction. Which was a return to you know monarchism and you know Catholic you know high Middle Ages type um, political theory, right? And I agree with you. I mean, in essence, I essentially, I mean, I'm a monarchist, and I'm highly um, skeptical of centralized state power. You know, so well, if you want to get really larpy, it's like co Confederate monarchy is the ideal system or whatever. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, I'm glad that you mentioned it being, being LARPy because uh, one of the things that, that I realized, I'm not, this is not me bitching at you guys or anything, but I was super idealistic in my 20s. So I was like a hardcore traditional Catholic monarchist and all this. And then, you know, as I developed into my 30s and now I'm, I'm approaching amazingly the end of my 30s, I was, um, I think I got a, a much better grasp on the like your your views have to be have to what am i trying to say the ideal has to to match up to the real and i don't i mean that in a mar, uh, like a marxist sense like praxis or something like that i just mean that that it, it's good and and well to have all of these uh you know sort of ideal, idealistic internet <laughs> based ideas right yeah but then we also live in a real world that's like totally 100% the opposite of that and I'm not saying that you guys don't realize that. I'm not, I'm not yeah. saying that at all. I'm just saying that, I mean, like, so, so, like, when I was into this stuff 10 years ago on the internet, nobody was into this. I'm not bragging. I'm not saying that, like, I was, like, I'm not. A, Jay Dyer, theological was, hipster. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, mean, I, I was reading a lot of this monarchist stuff, and, like, I read all of David Duke's stuff 10 years ago. I read Yaki. I read Spangler. I read all this stuff, like, 10 years ago, and, like, nobody believed this. So, I just didn't even think there was any point in talking about any of this stuff because it, like, who are you going to talk to about it? Like there might be one, there might be one forum. Right. And then you're just like, well, this forum's probably run by a bunch of feds. So like, what's the point of even going on? Right. So I just gave up even talking about it and didn't, I wasn't involved in any movements and just kind of settled into just kind of having, having fun and doing things my way with like the local, like working in a Rand Paul campaign or something like that. Cause again, I mean, nobody, I didn't even know anybody that knew about this stuff except for like two friends. I had two friends that knew about any of this stuff. So it's very surprised. I, I never would have guessed any of this stuff would be get such a resurgence. you know, 10 years ago, nobody knew who Evola was. 
Like you can talk to like two people. Right. Whatever. Well, now he's basically a household name on the far right. It, which, which is just <laughs> very, very strange. But uh, so what I'm getting at is just that, you know, the, these. I understand that these things through the internet, th this stuff can, you know, spill out into reality and you can't have change. Uh, there's a lot more possibilities, you know, as I was saying earlier than I would have dreamed of 10 years ago. But so I, I, in my view, I, I just I just hope for the alteration, perhaps, of the existing structures. I'd appreciate that approach of Dugan that, you know, he he doesn't think that you can have like a. Like, I mean, I'm, so, I'm for the new right movements like Le Pen and these things. They're not as perfect as, I, as I'd like them to be, but. But I think that if you have to, you almost have to kind of take over the existing structures. That's one of the things I liked about Trump. Right. Was that I think he did attempt to do that, uh, even though he's not perfect. Um, because yeah. I don't think I don't think you can, you can like start a whole other thing. I'm not saying you guys are saying that, but the ideal has to mesh with the real. And so I think that right. We we talked about this, you know, a lot. And basically, okay. the conclusion that you know we we've come to is is thus right. For me, I can speak from my own personal philosophy, and then I can speak kind of in general what we advocate in terms of tactics. I want to well, be look, a look, here, Here's what I say. I say we should adopt a lot of those left tactics, and that's right. what I think. The reason that the alt-right was successful was that they started using Alinsky-style tactics against the left online. Precisely, and, precisely. And uh, I was saying people – I'm not bragging because nobody listened to me 10 years ago, but I said 10 years ago people should be doing that. But nobody i had a blog back then that you know nobody was really listening to so but uh um i don't know i just I, you know what i should have just kept blogging because i'd be like 10 times more prominent than i am now if i had, <laughs> if I had not given it up 10 years ago well uh, there there is there's a bible verse that i think really captures all of this pretty good and that's the kingdom of god is not of this world we can't really get this perfect of all the uh, Chad, Chad, monarchy, or whatever you want to call it right. in this world. I mean, this, this is just beyond what we can get there. I mean, we can get like a, a virtue season, but we can't really get this uh, great absolute monarch. Well, look, though, here, here's something that occurred to me. Like, uh, I was talking about this in the Orthodox and the Religion of the Future talk I did. You know, so to prepare for the spread of Christianity, a lot of uh, theologians from various traditions have argued that Koine Greek is what ma helped make Christianity successful early on because you had a, a common language that spread through Alexander's conquest. So perhaps, and I'm just throwing this out as a possibility, I mean, we don't know what, what's coming in the future. There's all kinds of possibilities. And so the internet could be like the Koine Greek of our day for the spread of uh, you know, Orthodox theology in a total change. We, we just don't know. We don't have to have these, you know, achilleastic negative approaches to to the world and to the future. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. I we're not, uh, point, like, we're, we're not, um, you know, here's the thing is sometimes we get in the far right is you get kind of this reverse Marxism, except instead of class struggle, it's like the race war. And like the race war is this scientific inevitable fact that must and will occur because of like competing in groups you know and i mean there's a certain level of truth to you know different groups together or competing for resources there's going to be conflict but i also think that there, the future is not set well the, yeah, yeah, I mean, the internet has enabled the, the alt right i never would have dreamed of this 10 years ago so again the, what does that say well that says that there's all kinds of possibilities for the future yeah, I mean the problem is that you know it still has to manifest itself outside the the internet. Right. Uh, but I mean I, I agree that the internet has done a lot. I mean with the, without the internet, I mean I wouldn't know about Spain. I wouldn't read Spain. I wouldn't you know right. have heard of uh, Evola or any of these you know, guys. Right. Would probably be uh, some some Noemi or whatever you want to say. <laughs> well, I mean even Trump, uh, who could have seen that? Like even. Right. Right. two years ago and, and then all the stuff that he has just brought up in his campaign or even so far i mean that's huge yeah i mean you, you, you this is to stretch it a bit but you could kind of see trump as a spenglerian anglo caesar figure i mean he doesn't compete with uh, the legions like a germanic general caesar would do as spengler pointed out in i think it was prussianism and socialism but he uses the shekel to fight the shekel and he's winning <laughs> Now, maybe he is a part of the establishment. I mean, it, it's hard to know because, I mean, yeah. much of these things we actually do not know. 
we we right. get like guessing. Right. We're like trying to to make a theory with some dots of light uh, every yes. here and then. But still, uh, time will tell. Absolutely. Yeah. So going back to like what I was saying was that <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I think you're right, Jay. And I think that this is something that I've argued a lot on on this program is that. I mean, the, the the reason why we're in this precarious political situation is like a decline of virtue. I mean, that's it. If we had retained a society full of virtuous people, we never would have ever gotten to the situation where we experienced the cultural Marxism or the foreign invasion that we're experiencing now in Europe. And so yes, well, fundamentally, like that's – for me, like I, I want to be a priest, right? I want to be an Orthodox priest. I don't want to be a politician. Because I think yeah. that the, the direct issue is one that's spiritual. Exactly. I mean, yeah. the, the, the politician will always have to compromise and all this stuff. I mean, the, it is the actual mission of the church to be this this rock. You you can't have that in the sphere of politics. The, the priest, the, the church is must give the morals. That's why everything yeah. can be solved to a very large degree, at least, if you actually just have the church back in society. I mean, take exactly. even even things that can seem unrelated. For example, let's 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 say, I mean, Sweden, we have a tons of people to basically sitting uh, home alone all the time. Imagine if these people go to to church every Sunday, they would meet new people, they would yep. get a sense of meaning in life and all this stuff. But yes. we don't go there because we say, oh, I want to sit at home and I want to, I don't know, uh, watch football or play games yeah. or. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Look at it this way. Like, I, there's a reason why football, I think, is on Sunday because you're going oh, to yeah. sit at home and watch. You know, it's like what you were saying earlier, Jay, about movies being kind of a ritual. Well, I don't think professional football or any other pro sports is any different. Yeah. And I mean, plus, you know, maybe I'm over analyzing a bit, but. I mean, what's a football? It's two teams and they're competing to win for the sake of winning. I mean, that's that's this, you know, Nietzschean mentality is rising for the sake of rising. Uh, yeah. While in the church, you don't have that. You have, you, you, you know your place, you're supposed to have a certain order. And I mean, in the liturgy, every single person you know, has his place. I mean, you have, you, have, you know, we have incense. It's beautiful. You have a reader, you have, uh, you know, the deacons, you have the priest, you have the bishop and all this stuff. They all know their place and it's... A symphony. It's beautiful. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. It it points to the eternal, and that was uh, the big victory of the devil. You could argue was uh, the removal of the notion of eternality and and fixity from political and social life. And what that did was basically just leave everybody in flux, as we've talked about many times and then what happens is the state steps in to fill that void be it the corporate yeah. state be it the marxist state be it whatever state you want uh and that and it becomes the new god and it becomes the new yeah. you know are you uh, but, by, by, in here no no but but by the way the, there's one thing here uh, I, I gotta say this before i forget it that's really really freaky and you talk about this how the state becomes god these transgender people who want, you know, a third legal gender or, or, you know, want to change legal gender, it's the same thing here. They are so insecure, they want, you know, this this reassurement. Oh, you are actually women. And this is why they get so happy when they get, like, a new social security number. The state is their god, and their god has acknowledged them with a new gender. It's absurd, yes. it's sick, and it's, it's just, it's sad. And they lash out if you, you point it out. Well, that's why yeah. people don't understand. A lot of times people will mistake me for a libertarian or they'll mistake me for a statist. And I try to explain that, no, 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 I'm neither one because the only way to have liberty is to have law. And the only way to have law is to have a grounding in divine law. Otherwise, yeah. you're at the whims of uh, the power elite, will to power and the state yeah. uh, and monetary power. Uh, and all of that is <clears throat> the only way to have Law. The only way to have a moral society is to have God in society. Exactly. Uh, uh, otherwise, all... you've got just will to power. Yes, exactly. You're absolutely right. Um, I'm sorry if I cut you off a bit, but this is well, no. And, and these, these transgender people are so stupid because the uh, 1969 uh, Population Council memo from Bernard Berelson. Uh, to Planned Parenthood says that all of this was weaponized. It's all to destroy them. So. Uh, that's actually a biblical principle, too. I mean, I think it's in Amos or somewhere, but it even talks about the fact that barrenness itself is a judgment from God. So 
uh, it, 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 people become their own worst enemies. And then, you know, as Paul says in Romans one, God hands them over. So yeah. very sad, but, but, uh, the, the irony of all this is that none of the, none of these people will go into the future. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, that's the thing with, like, uh, birth rates, you know, like, uh, yeah. you get a lot of white nationalists that are, like, all worried about birth rates. Well, yeah. when you control for, like, liberals who do not have children, uh, white birth rates are actually doing well because it's religious conservatives that are having children. <laughs> yes, and I wanted to add another point, too, that you're absolutely right to talk about the loss of virtue because— uh, the main problem that I have with any of the independent movements, uh, alt-right, libertarian, uh, so-called conservative, uh, all these different things, their main problem is that they have the, the liberal presupposition that there is an external solution to these problems. Uh, it's going to be Trump. It's going to be the alt-right. It's going to be the implementation of a monarchy. It's going to be this, 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 this. None of these external things are going to solve the problem, which is located ultimately in man himself in terms of his heart. So you have to have a change in people's attitudes, a change in heart, metanoia, repentance, before you can think about the external. So that's why you're absolutely right. Well, that that's, the theological that's, absolute, that's precise. And this is, we actually just did an episode on spiritual warfare a couple of episodes ago. I mean, and this is what we talk about. Is, I mean, you have a specific in this in his metaphysics of war. It's just that all victory externally is a manifestation of the internal victory over the passions. Yes. Exactly. Uh, I mean, yeah. this is this is this is a, a widely acknowledged, you know, fact. You guys can go back and listen to this. But yeah, I mean, I just let's just get hit the race and liberalism thing for a second. I mean, there are a lot of people on the alt right or the far right. You know, I mean, we're pretty harshly critical of Richard Spencer, you know, for this, uh, is that, you know, basically what they want is, in their own words, like a nice white country. And so they want to go back to this 1920s, 1950s, bourgeois, capitalist, you know, white lifestyle. Um, and they think that if we remove Negroes and Hispanics, you know, I mean, the undesirable races, that we can, you know, go back to reclaim this, like, lost vision of white America that once was, this Norman Rockwell photo. <laughs> and I guess what I just wanted to add, you know, say, like, say is like, I wanted to talk about why operating on these fundamentally like enlightenment liberal presuppositions and worldviews are ultimately just going to lead to us going right back to the place that we are today and that we need to reject the worldview and the metaphysical claims that have led us to this situation. And if we don't do that, it's it's we're just going to wind right back up where we started. Well, that's what, why uh, one of the reasons uh, that I talk so much about Darwinism and about, uh, well, more and more I've been talking about higher critical approaches to destroying belief in Scripture is that that's what led to a lot of where we are now. So uh, I know that Richard's view is that I believe he said something to the effect of that he eventually got tired of Christianity at some point because he realized that the, a bunch of the New Testament texts talk about uh, like the return of Christ and that most churches have interpreted this imminently, like in Matthew 24 or, uh, you know, readings of the book of Revelation or something like that. And so therefore, because Christ didn't return to the people that he was speaking to in his immediate audience, be it the apostles or John's, uh, you know, letter to the seven churches or whatever. Therefore, you know, obviously the, the New Testament has uh, faulty data uh, uh, or Christ was wrong or whatever. And so one of the great things that I learned uh, when I was a Protestant, when I was a Reconstructionist Calvinist, was that uh, a lot of this is understood in terms of preterism. And preterism is the idea that many, many of these prophecies are fulfilled in the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Uh, and that actually becomes a great testimony to the veracity of the scriptures when you understand this. So uh, just to make this brief, I know we could go on, on this topic for forever, but uh, if you look at Luke 21, that's actually a more enlightening commentary on what's going on at 70 AD and, and the uh, Olivet Discourse of Christ than just what you read in Matthew 24. So like if you just read Matthew 24, a lot of people get 
uh, pigeonholed into this kind of John Hagee evangelical nonsense where they think that Matthew 24 is talking about the end of the world in totality. Now, I believe that no. it is. It yeah. is partly talking about the end of the world. But uh, if you read Luke's, Luke's account, Luke 21, uh, it, it, it sheds further light on the fact that Jesus is talking about what they're going to see in their generation, and he talks about the the the, the temple Jerusalem will be surrounded by the by the Roman armies. You know, Titus Vespasian comes in and destroys the temple in 70 A.D. And all of this matches up perfectly to what you find in the Book of the Apocalypse. So, once that's understood, like a, a lot of these supposed higher critical arguments about the uh, falsehood of the New Testament fall apart. Well, you know, that's absolutely, it's, it's precise. And I mean, this, once you have this, um, this key, I mean, you see this message echo throughout the entirety of this, of not even just the Synoptic Gospels, but also the Gospel of John. I mean, like a good example is this is, so, I mean, we, you know what, we should just get right into theology because this is, I mean, I'm, I'm studying this in university, so this is my okay. podcast. So we're just going to talk about theology. Um, you know, John very explicitly talks about like, all of the all of the valleys being filled and the roads made straight, right? And this is the witness that he offers at the beginning of the Gospel of John, after the prologue, you know, dis- describing the Word becoming flesh. And so, the in the Gospel of John, the first person that the uh, that the Word that Jesus Christ announces his divinity to is the Samaritan um, uh, licentious woman, or when he's by the well, the well of Jacob. And so the theology of the Samaritans, you know, actually they what they believed was that, you know, the the true they were in fact like the true remnant of the worship of Israel descended from the priesthood of Aaron. Yeah, I'm familiar. Right. Right, exactly. And so they believed that, you know, their their temple had been buried underneath um, Mount um, the Gerzai. Gerizim, yeah. Gerizim, in that, you know, when the Messiah, the one who was to come, it came back, he was going to blow the top off the temple off the mountain rather and reveal the temple and everybody was going to worship in truth. So Jesus reveals, you know, his um, divinity to this woman. And he says, you know, actually you kind of have got it wrong that it's going to be worshiped. The worship is going to be in truth and in the spirit all over the world. But at the same time, he doesn't blow the top off the temple. He doesn't blow the top off the mountain and reveal the temple, but he does lay flat the temple in Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. And so this is, in my personal, you know, uh, exegesis of this is this is the fulfillment directly of what John is talking about in the prophecy of Isaiah. Um, you know that the the <laughs> the valleys are going to be filled, right? That there's this like equalization of um, you know in in this this kind of procession of the eschaton, this equalization of these uh, physical places of worship, and that it's you know fundamentally the the spirit. <laughs> that is pleasing to God, not the temple edifices. Yes, there are many, many texts in the Old Testament and in Isaiah that speak precisely of uh, Gentile ministers in the church. I mean, Isaiah says that. He says, you know, Gentiles will be your priests. And they're like, you know, the Jews are like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? Kill us. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, and, and then at the, at the end of Romans, of course, you know, Paul quotes uh, – many of the Psalms to that effect that, uh, you know, all of the nations are going to be joined uh, with Israel in the worship of the true God. So, so absolutely. In other words, I'm just getting that, that uh, you're, you're, you are correct to point out that the culmination of the old covenant in 70 AD is crucial to understanding a lot of the Bible. And it's crucial to understanding Daniel two and Daniel seven and Daniel nine. And unfortunately many have not. And that's also it also is the patristic teaching. Uh, I've dug up many quotes uh, from St. John Chrysostom and others uh, that do talk about uh, preterism. So anyway, um, yeah, I mean, once you dismantle that point of the higher critics, and and a lot of people are scared of higher criticism. They get intimidated because they're like, oh, they studied Hebrew and linguistics. But the, actually, when you understand a lot of their presuppositions, it's very easy to dismantle. It's just like Darwinism, right? It's like has all this veneer of like being scientific and scientism and technical and all that, but it's actually not that, not that profound. In fact, um, I can't find, I, I forgot this woman's name, but she's like a Yale professor or something. And, and what you discover is that, uh, she's got these lectures on YouTube on uh, Julius Valhausen 
And Veldhausen was the father of higher critics and uh, documentary hypothesis and all that. And uh, what's funny about Veldhausen is, is that he says he has an agenda. Like, like his agenda is to yeah. Destroy. This is this is the father of like you know the Yeoistic um, yeah JEPD yeah yeah exactly. So uh, he says he has an agenda. So this is not. I thought we were doing like neutral, objective scientific inquiry here, right? No, no, actually we have an agenda. Uh, and so anyway, there's this Yale woman who's like the stu a student of Velhausen and higher critical stuff. And anyway, what's funny is that she's she's got these lectures where she's she's summarizing where textual criticism has has gone in the last few years and like they don't believe in q anymore right so q was like this huge linchpin in their theories of the origins of you know where we get mark the gospel right. of mark and all this kind of stuff uh and oh no actually we've discarded that so just like darwinism what you realize is that like, they literally every day, they're overturning all their supposed proofs and theories and, and, and you know, arguments against the the veracity of the text. Uh, and so there actually isn't a consistent, coherent position that these people have, right? Now, I'm not saying that there's not textual difficulties and all that. Obviously, there are places in the text, Old and New Testament, where, you know, there's mysteries and things we don't know. But what they do is leap on this kind of stuff, and they try to build these giant cases of, you know, nonsense for which there's absolutely no evidence. It's just some academic trying to make a name for themselves and, you know, talking about queer theory in the Gospel of John or some bullshit yeah. like that. Well, right. precisely. I actually just read um, an article by um, uh, Thomas Hopko called The Bible in the Orthodox Church. Mm -hmm. And he was basically talking about, you know, I mean, he, he was giving the, the Orthodox position on the integration of textual criticism um, into like an Orthodox understanding of scripture. And I mean, he points out like very accurately that like, this is not new. I mean, literary criticism, you know, form Gescheit, all this kind of stuff. I mean, the, the church fathers did this. Sure. I mean, it's, it's like, you know, the, it was not invented, you know, in, in the 19th to 20th century. Yeah, but unfortunately, a lot of the the mainline Orthodox world will will tend to just go along with all these presuppositions, just like Roman Catholic higher criticism did too. Uh, and then once you buy into those presuppositions of like documentary hypothesis and all this stuff, uh, you're just led down the road of uh, like oh, even Roman Ides, uh, you know, bought into all the higher critical stuff and then uh, admits that uh, the Bible's got errors and uh, oh well, looks like evolution might be true and all this kind of stuff. So uh, it's just a dangerous path to, once you, once you buy the presuppositions, you'll, you can be led down anywhere in any, any of these dangerous paths. And the key point that none of these people figure out to do is to question the presuppositions themselves. And the very fact that, you know, the, the latest higher critical scholars will sit there and talk about the fact that there's not a single documentary hypothesis and it changes every few years shows that this is not really what it's been presented as. It's been sold by these globalist funded things like the Jesus Quest as if it was this huge scientific, technical, scholarly endeavor. And it's not, it has an agenda. All right. So you look at like Elaine Pagel's uh, Gnostic Gospels book, right? And she'll talk about in the introduction to it that the UN has supported her work and the promotion wow. of the discovery of the, now, so there's an agenda behind these things, right? So the Gnostic gospels and the promotion of this across the world and the Da Vinci code and all that, it has a specific purpose and big players behind it. It's not just an organic development, nor is higher criticism. Higher criticism is uh, supported by all these, uh, because, because there are people who are devious and who are smart and they know what things will destroy a religion. Yeah, I mean, this much of this doesn't even seem to be much, you know, new stuff. It's just all these old heresies that are being revamped and re, you know, uh, remade. And I mean, you can see another thread with all of these different sects is that they take like one verse from the Bible and they build a whole system out of it. Yeah, I mean, you can see this with the charismatics, for example. You know, the 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 Holy Spirit is going to you know flood all over the place. And and that's exactly what the higher critics do. They do the same thing as the as the sect yeah. the charismatics exactly. And this this really sad. I mean, people are buying up into this. And you know, from my experience, from what I see in this country. I mean, many people go to this sex because they realize that something is wrong in the world. They can't really say what it is, but something right. is wrong. 
but then they get caught up in this instead and it slowly they just sink further 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 into the swamp and eventually uh yeah they, they think they can uh fake feel through telepathy or some shit yeah yes yeah to kind of continue on in the theology and then we'll hit kali yuga news um one of the things that actually accompanied my conversion to orthodoxy was actually something that you wrote, Jay, is when you talked about, and you wrote the article for the soul of the East, how the West became atheist, and you did your deconstruction of like Thomistic theology, and you kind of laid out how divine simplicity, you know, and, and the lack of an energy essence distinction in God eventually leads to this you can't have a personal relationship with God if you can never come into contact with his essence. And he only has essence. He has no energies to you for you to contact with. Like I read that, you know, and so I'm a, I'm a third year theology student in an undergraduate degree. And I, I read that and I was like, wow. Um, it was at the very, I, I, I comprehended it and I understood it. And I realized that I had, you know, no, no reputation for that. Right. Yeah, St. Gregory Palamas' argument against Barlam is where, where that comes from. Right, exactly. And, you know, for me, that was a huge talk, you know, about presupposition destroying. That was like one of the kind of, you know, icebreaker things for me that really started to make me look critically at the Catholic system of, you know, domestic theology and, and philosophy right. and the entire intellectual construct that's presented. Because, you know, when I was a Catholic, I mean, I remember, you know, if every day— whatever the Pope would say something, you know, manifestly heretical, right? You know, yeah. you'd have to, I'd have to go to the, like the, the right wing Catholic forum, TRS, and I'd have to explain, okay, no guys, but you have to understand this is the, you know, the gates of Hades shall not prevail against the, you know, the rock of Peter, right? And yeah, that endless, was, endless mental gymnastics. I did it for years. Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. You know, or, well, you know, or Vatican II didn't change any theology. It wasn't a real ecumenical council. So we don't have to, it's, you don't have to worry about it. And then you actually study the council documents and it's like, ah, that's not true. <laughs> the ecclesiology exactly. completely I, I, changes. I, I, <laughs> uh, back in the day, um, when I was going to both SSPX and set of a conscious masses, I, uh, got to know Jerry Maddox, and I don't know if you know Jerry Maddox, but he no, used to be, not. well, he used to be like a hardcore Calvinist, and he was a student of Bonson, and then he converted to, he was like an early, like an 80s convert out of Calvinism into uh, Catholicism, and ended up having like 10 or 11 kids, and like he, like he was a hardcore, super, super smart dude, I mean, like one of the smartest dudes I've ever met, and um, so Jerry it was an apologist, and then he uh, he would debate all the Protestants, and he was very good, by the way. And um, he debated his former master, uh, Greg Bonson, one time in a famous debate. And um, so I eventually uh, got to know Jerry a little bit, and we had a debate. Uh, and it was when I was really getting into, into orthodoxy. And you know, it was it was the same kind of thing. Like I, I really I presented all of this kind of stuff to him, and this was about ten years ago. And and um, and I think that it really bothered him. Uh, I mean, Jerry more or less conceded the debate, but, but he wasn't going to give up the, the traditional Catholic thing because that's, well, that's, that's kind of one of the, it, it one, yeah, it's your identity. And, so, and one of the things that you do when you're a trad Catholic is like you, you're very leery of being convinced by reason or like an argument or a debate because you feel like, well, the the what I really need to do is pray the rosary more. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 the reason that I'm being put in this situation and and maybe doubting or thinking orthodoxy or something might be true is because I haven't been praying the rosary, the rosary right? enough. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I, I had a set of a contest, uh, priest uh, or maybe it was SSPX. I don't remember. But one of the priests was saying that to me one time. Like I was bringing a lot of these these issues to him, and I was saying, "What about this? What about the filioque? What about essence energy distinction? This 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 this." this. And it was like, my son. My son, shush, shush, shush. pray the rosary. You need to pray the rosary. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, okay. Oh, actually, I did pray the rosary this morning, but this this is not like answering this question. So I don't think That's that. That's funny I, that you, know, you say that. I had um, I had like a like a pretty radical Pauline conversion experience to Orthodoxy, and I had prayed the rosary that morning. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, and like it, <laughs> I exactly, I know 100% what you mean. And that was the thing for me is that 
you know, you had these kind of the papist blinders on where, you know, you're like, this is the rock of Peter, nothing, you know, nothing's going to go wrong. And you never demolish those presuppositions. And then when I ran into your article and it was like presuppositions refuted, it was like, oh, my goodness, you know, and I, I tried to talk to, you know, different Orthodox and Catholic priests about it and I wouldn't get a serious response. Even like you know, I've got a I've got a priest friend of mine who was at the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith with Ratzinger, and he's got a couple of PhDs, mm-hmm. right? And I could I didn't get a satisfactory response. Yeah, I reached out to like the um, the Vatican's uh, dude for uh, dialogue with the Eastern churches, and mm-hmm. you know I didn't feel like I got a satisfactory response from him either. And I mean, I for a while there I tried to utilize the the Vatican statement on the filioque that came out I don't know a while back maybe under John Paul II or something I don't remember the date but they issued some kind of statement about the filioque and then but then eventually you realize that you know what it's not just about the filioque like there's this whole all this other stuff about I started realizing that it's really the question of divine simplicity and the essence energy distinction because that is nowhere taught in Roman Catholic theology. And I don't, yeah, I know that these guys will try to pull out uh, Duns Scotus and the, and the Scotus view, but actually this, it's not there either. You don't, I don't think you can, I mean, the Scotus might have had disagreements with Thomism, but so what? That's not the point. The point is not just disagreements with Thomism. It's the fact that, you know, look, Trent, the Boston Catechism, all these catechisms, they're not teaching me the basics of you know, essence energy distinction that all the Orthodox fathers teach. You see what I'm saying? So it's like, right. we can yeah, have, exactly. all, we can have, yeah, we can have all this academic discussion and, and maybe you can find some Franciscan, you know, theologian that n- nobody's ever heard of from like 500 years ago that like clued into this and somehow got something right about the essence energy distinction. But it doesn't matter because, you know, in, in the, dozens of Catholic churches and priests I went to and met with and liturgies I went to, I never heard this. So it's it's right. absolutely irrelevant. Well, it's precisely, I mean, even more than, when you pair that with the Thomistic view of the soul, like there's no noose, it's like, you, you know, it's, it, 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 you begin to realize like, holy moly. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's not just one thing like the filioque or the essence energy distinction. It's, it's like this whole different anthropology, this whole different view of, eschatology, because, you know, in Thomism, there's hardly any place for the body in the afterlife. Uh, Then you read, like, St. Gregory Palamas, and it's like a totally different view, where it's like the body has, like, obviously an important role. I mean, what's the point of the freaking resurrection if, if if the afterlife and Thomism is just staring into divine essence for all eternity. Right, the beatific vision, right. Yeah, it's just stupid. It's like, come on, there's a whole, why was Jesus resurrected in a body? Come on. Yeah, no, exactly. So, so, that was yeah, the other. So that was, and that was yeah, yeah. It was interesting. That was another pre, uh, like presupposition that when I first was catechizing myself into the Catholic Church, that I there were two things for me that when I was catechizing myself as a Catholic, sent up big red flags. The first was their teaching on the soul after death. Um, you know, which for those who aren't aware, it's the, the traditional formula is the four last things: death, judgment, heaven, hell. Right, mm-hmm. like that's it. You know. Um, and that like they don't even some of them will admit that there's like a, a period of transmigration maybe, right? But they, that's basically what they, it's like a legalistic formula. And you know like my my father is a is a you know has a doctorate in anthropology and has done a, a lot of work with you know various different indigenous groups all across the world. And like this is a man like empirically it's incorrect from an anthropological perspective. This is not how anybody perceives the soul to progress after the death. What, what do you, can you flesh this out? I'm not following you. What do you mean? Uh, what I mean is that, like, you know, so the idea, you know, in, in, in Catholic theology that, like, you die, you know, your soul separates from your body, and then you're immediately uh-huh. judged, and, like, it doesn't really stay on the earth. You know, the, only, the ghosts are just, like, manifestations of people who are in purgatory, so they're going to be saved anyway. You know, there's no, there's no intermediate stages, you know, pr- like, you pray for the dead because they might be in purgatory. Right. There, oh, there's, okay. You know, there, right. Like this, this for me, you contradict it anthropologically with what, you know, could be manifestly observed across 
like the entire history of the world about what people have always observed about what happens with the soul after it dies, right? If there's clearly oh, okay. a, a period of transition and things like that. Ah, yes. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. I see. Yes. And the, like, other, the other thing was like, what sorry, was go on. In like to the Tibetan Book of the Dead and stuff. Yeah, sure. As an example like that. As an um, example, right. Right. You know, and the second thing for me is like when I read that, okay, like, so this, so the Pope is the Supreme Pontiff. So he has total jurisdiction and faculties to celebrate the sacraments come from proper jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have proper jurisdiction, you can't have real faculties to celebrate the sacraments. Mm -hmm. And that means that if the Pope wanted to, he could sign a piece of paper and none of the Orthodox would be able to celebrate mass. Because he could just remove all of their jurisdiction automatically, and he doesn't do that out of charity. Well, actually, in canon law, uh, the, the if you espouse a heresy or a schism, you're supposed to ipso facto lose your jurisdiction. So you don't have the you're not supposed to have the operation of the keys. Uh, now, uh, in Rome, as I understand, now I could be wrong about I'm not like a canon law specialist, but I did focus on this a lot in my twenties. Uh, as I, if I recall. Uh, you can illicitly do these masses and offer the sacraments outside the Roman Catholic tr uh, tradition. I'm speaking in terms of traditional canon law, right. not the updated 1983 John Paul version, which is yeah, yeah, weird. Yeah. Uh, but traditionally speaking, uh, illicit masses are still valid, but they're done illicitly. So the Orthodox masses are just kind of like the same status as like the SSPX masses. Right. Um, so that was that was my understanding that that. You lose, you do lose, you lose jurisdiction, jurisdiction in the operation of the keys, simply ipso facto by uh, espousing and uh, teaching heresy or going into schism. So I don't, I don't know. I mean, I'm not trying to get into some weird canon law debate, but no, I mean, no, I really, the whole, the whole thing is very bizarre. And once, once you try to live out all this kind of stuff, and it's, it's very difficult, it's very confusing, and. Uh, a lot, I started noticing weird things like a lot of the SSPX priests would have uh, obsessive compo uh, OCD. Hmm. I'm not joking. I'm not joking. And so I was wondering why. And then I, I met a priest one time who was talking about having to counsel other SSPX priests who have these problems with OCD. <laughs> and uh, then I realized that one time I remember uh, there was a, an SSPX guy who was talking about that he he was saying the consecration one time in the mass and he sneezed and he felt like it was a mortal sin because he sneezed, I'm not joking oh, because he goodness. because he had not done like the proper uh, uh, I guess blowing of his nose before mass or something <laughs> so he felt like he was he had committed mortal sin and then he wondered about the consecration and it, I was just like this is ludicrous like this is insane like who in the right mind would ever <laughs> Like, if if this is the God that we're talking about here, it's just mind. Like, it was just it was just insanity. And I because right. it's so hyper legalistic and so utterly removed from like, I mean, how in the world would this have religion have ever spread if you know you, you go to hell for eating meat on Fridays? <laughs> like you're you're going to hell for sneezing accidentally during a consecrate. I mean, you can't even control that. So. Point being was that yeah it was like we, when you read things like uh, Pius V's uh, uh, you know decree on on the mass and all that kind of stuff and that's one of you know one of their big arguments is that uh, it's a a perpetual apostolic decree you know that you can't change uh, the Latin mass and so forth I mean it, and it has all these specifications and so forth and obviously Rome changed it so you yeah. know either <laughs> either these things mean what they say or they don't and then well exactly well and that was the thing and i'm taking this i'm taking yeah. this absolutely absurd course in my university on like vatican II ecclesiology it's literally called ecclesiology in an ecumenical age the female professor who's teaching it is an associate of the world council of churches right exactly and then so uh mortalium animos i've always found was the most was the strongest point because it's what 1928 pius 11th uh, says that uh ecumenical uh, celebrations, actions, or apostasy. And I could never, ever get any other Catholics to explain anything other than that. Well, that was just his understanding at that time. And I'm like, I'm sorry, it, it can't be the ordinary papal teaching that 
Yeah, it, how, if the ordinary magisterium is infallible, yeah. how's this work, boys? Yeah, so I never got any anything coherent out of that, and then and then eventually it just kind of dawned dawn on me. So like the first thing I read was uh, Dr. Sherard's uh, Greek East and the Latin West, and that was like a really big thing that hit me. And then I was also branching out into actually reading the Eastern Fathers themselves, because prior to that, you know, I just I really just focused on Augustine and Ambrose and Jerome and. Uh, then Aquinas and, you know, the, the medieval Latin guys. And I, I just did never really branch out into the Eastern Eastern guys because I thought, well, you know, they're important and they matter, but they don't matter like these dudes, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, it's funny, after, so I had this conversion experience, right? And then I began to seriously, like, look at everything that was going on to discern what had just happened. And so are you familiar with Michael Welton's book, Two Paths? Um, it's by Regina that, Press. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm not. Well, basically, it's like a non-polemical refutation of like the Catholic claims about orthodoxy. And so he's compiled like all of these the these lists of quotes from the church fathers, basically talking about, you know, interpretations of, um, you know, it's like Matthew 16, 18 or whatever, or am I okay. getting the quote wrong, you know, and like the authority of the ecumenical council and whether bishops have, you know, can be infallible and sort of stuff. And it, I remember like I read this book. And my jaw just like dropped because I was like, it was such a, like the church fathers were so bold faced again and again and again and again and again, directly contradicting, you know, the claims of the papacy. Well, you know, I, I, this was such a huge problem for me for so long throughout my twenties. And uh, I think I read like five or six of Ratzinger's books, for example. So one of the things that really hit me was, uh, I think it's an introduction to Christianity or, or one of the one of the other more philosophical tomes that he wrote, he makes the statement in a footnote that that the the, the ecumenical church, East and West, for the first thousand years did not operate on the principle of papal supremacy. And that blew me away that he says that in that footnote. Right. I could go fish I could go fish it out if you want, but you can find it pretty easy if you if you Google it. Um, but he says it for the first millennium, the church didn't operate this way. And so, right. He's like, mm, mm. here's the Pope telling me that the church did not operate in a Vatican one mindset for the first thousand years. So, I mean, and there's so many examples of stuff like that. So eventually, though, it just got to the point where I was like, you know, like, I mean, I'm not saying you can't get all involved in like the really intricacy laden arguments of from Catholicism. But after a while, it's just kind of like, I mean, I don't have, I don't even have to worry about that because I mean, just look at Francis. He's a clown. Yeah. He's just, he's, he's a complete clown. And, um, Take, for example, the, the argument that Roman Catholics often make that, oh, you know, without the papacy that you, you, you can't have the church, it all just fall, falls apart. Well, the mere fact that for a thousand years, orthodoxy still exists and hasn't had the pope suggests to me that like that, <laughs> like that, that big Catholic apologetic argument is just simply not true. Like, how is orthodoxy right. still around? Uh, if it, if we still require the pope, it, it just doesn't make sense. And I think Father Matthew is very correct when he says that, you know, orthodoxy really, yeah, we can talk about orthodox emperors and we can talk about patriarchs and all this stuff, but really it's it's not as centralized as even orthodoxy tends to think. You know, orthodoxy even tends to, especially in the West, tends to think in this, this papal mindset that like, you know, to have an orthodox church, you know, we got to have like some gigantic patriarch somewhere. No, you know. no, really no. Right. I, that's the thing. And it's, you know, all you need is a bishop with valid apostolic succession and the right belief. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I started asking questions myself, like even when I was Catholic, like if papal supremacy is true, why are Orthodox emperors calling the councils? That doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hmm. Right. Why? Why was it not the Pope who was calling the councils? That's a, that's a good question, right? Yeah, and then now why, would, why would like and then the Pope crowns like another Roman emperor in the West. Right. And then he does. Why doesn't he call the councils? Like, well, see, see, if you read the Acts of the Seventh Council, uh, I, I think that was very important. Uh, you know, the, the iconoclasm council, because they call the emperor the God ordained God bearing emperor or something to that effect. Yeah. Now, if the if the emperor at the council at 787 is, and everybody believes, 
the seventh council against iconoclasm, right? right. <laughs> like, if he, if, if that's like, how could there be this other one? <laughs> yes, yes. Or how could you just crown this other emperor, right? So I think that the, I think there's something to you know the Roman ID's thesis of uh, the Frankist, uh, Frankish uh, theology and all this kind of stuff and. There's something to that. I don't buy everything Roman ID says. I'm, I'm actually I'm not that big of a fan of Roman ID anymore. But there is something to that uh, Carolingian deviation in that period, where because um, you have an explicit change in uh, iconology, actually. Right. Uh, this is you know, and so there, there, there's something going on here. This is where the filioque starts to to creep in something's going on so no you know i mean this is this is absolutely i mean we could probably talk about this for like three or four more hours with an interruption i i got a question though um sure, now I, i'm going to talk in spengler in terms of bits where, where do you think we can draw the line between when uh, the the thousand christians so to speak become essentially papism and when it becomes just just western orthodoxy i mean where exactly should we draw the line there i mean what should we keep and what could we react and uh... i'm sorry i didn't understand that could you repeat it where should we draw the line between you know a western or faustian uh, adaptation of christianity uh a sort of western orthodoxy if you will and uh, this you know uh, heretical borderline heretic uh, papism Oh, you mean in history? Uh, yeah, and uh, in in practice as well these days. Oh, okay. Hmm. Yeah, that's a very difficult question. Um, I tend to be a little forgiving just because of my own track, you know, out of out of uh, Roman Catholic stuff and and towards the East. To you know, I I, I just I don't want to be too judgmental of people in the Middle Ages who you know like um, people will say, oh look. Uh, you know, venerable bead included the filioque. Uh, you know, I, th I think that a lot of those people didn't know what was going on in other parts of the empire or the realm, or, you know, I, I, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. So I'm trying to say, so I, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know when, when is the, you know, the definitive point, which, um, which we need to like <laughs> cut it off. I don't know, but yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, I think, and I think because, for cont for contemporary Western stuff, you know, you get into the the issue of the jurisdictional problems in America, and I have no idea. I have I have no clue how to yeah. how any of that can be solved. So, yeah, but maybe it's maybe it's just mental gymnastics. Um, I'm I'm not even a Catholic, so I don't know why I'm going full papist into the defense league, but. Uh, couldn't you say that the submission to to the Roman pontiff, the, the pope, so to speak, would be a sort of uh, Faustian hierarchy, right? It's it's reaching for the stars, but it's like reaching from God. So you, you kind of go yeah. from below upwards uh, rather than from God through the energies to, you know, uh, the creation, so to speak, as you have in the East. Yes, uh, but, but it's also true that, like, the history of... The relationship between the various uh, sees and patriarchates has been messy. So we, we have a, a pretty messy history of the church. And so you have the Acacian schism where you had problems, uh, you know, even back in the fourth and fifth century that are roughly similar to what you get with uh, the Roman split. And there were times when many of the patriarchs of Constantinople were were, her were heretics, like awful. And, uh, yeah. and, Ro and Rome was orthodox. So so that's you know that's the reality in the history of the church, and I, I I think that the thesis that what happened to Rome uh, is is also political is very important. Is that you did have uh, Frankish power that wanted to to have an empire that wasn't subject to Constantinople, uh, that wasn't subject to what had already been declared as orthodox. And, and authoritative so there's something to that but i, I you know i don't know man there's <laughs> yeah very tough they're very tough questions so yeah i mean basically what i'm trying to hint at is perhaps the the sort of papist mentality at least 
could be very valid and orthodox with a few, you know, uh, cutting off certain things, perhaps, within the realm of the Western civilization, because that would basically oh. adapt our mentality to yeah. the Christian view. Yeah, so like if, and I think what's going to happen is that Rome, because of Vatican II and, and charging forward <laughs> into total madness uh, with, uh, with Frank, uh, is that there's going to uh, Frankenstein. Just call me George. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, you're going to see the dis the continued dissolution of it, and people are just going to filter out into things like orthodoxy. So, yeah. uh, you know, could the could uh, you have the? I mean, we, uh, ideally, we should just have like Western Orthodox churches. Well, that's what I you desperately know, love to have, but yeah, that's what we should we should have, and it's just a very weird, difficult situation. But I, but I, I have hope, and I I have a, a optimistic view of the future that I think that yes, you you could eventually have. I mean, hey, there have been cases of mass conversions of Protestants, right, to, to Orthodox theology, and I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see that kind of stuff in the future, right? like mass conversions of— I actually talked to a union about this, and his personal opinion is that what's going to occur is, you know, George or whoever comes after him is just going to declare something heretical ex cathedra, and everybody who takes it seriously is just going to schism, so— Yes, and I mean, we've already seen that with SSPX, and, and eventually— you know, the SSPX itself now is, is splitting into two camps. So, you know, how, how long are you going to be able to maintain the, <laughs> the mythology that, uh, you know, Rome has been her quasi heretical, material heretical for however many decades now, 50, is it going to be like 300 years without a Pope? I mean, come on, uh, you know, yeah, eventually, yeah. eventually, eventually these people are going to, uh, you know, filter their way out into what's, what's still around. And I think that, what everybody's wanting is what was always there. Everybody, we want the theology and the church of the first thousand years. That's what everybody wants deep down. Who's serious yeah. about it deep down? No, I, I agree with you 100%. Yeah. And I mean, I have a really kind of good view of this myself because I talk to like a lot of young men and women who are like nationalists, who are moral, and it's like they're, they're dying for orthodoxy. And so, anyway, let's uh, go into Kali Yuga news so that we don't go into like a four hour podcast or anything like that. Oh, the um, worst parts. So, hey, we, uh, we've done, I've done record ones. We did one that was over six hours. Wow. <laughs> God bless you, fam. <laughs> go ahead. Okay. So, Jay, the way basically that we usually do Kali Yuga news is that everybody kind of picks a story and then they kind of read the headline and then they'll discuss the story, you know, read a little bit of the body and then we'll discuss it. So, uh, being the guest of honor, I want to give you the first pick. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't prepare for that. I don't, I don't have any. I'm kind of just sitting here and. and oh no, you don't. Well, there, it's in the it's in the show notes. So here. I don't, I don't have those pulled up. I'm actually on my phone so that I can walk uh, around. I, I like ah, to, I, like I see. I like to pace and talk. Uh, no, 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 perfectly fine. Then uh, one right, of us so uh, will. Uh, go ahead. Sure. Grieva Hans, why would you go first? Oh, Grieve? Well, it looks like Grieve's dropped the ball as well. Speech. Oh, I'll never pick. mind, never mind. Sorry, my microphone was muted. Uh, <laughs> I'll pick the, the non one. Uh, uh, speaking of speech, right? Uh, <laughs> Let's just read the headline here. Uh, non, shocks, non shocks church by suggesting Jesus' mother wasn't a virgin. <laughs> now, if you, I, I just want to say one thing here. If you look at the nose of this uh, this nun, it echoes a bit. Um, a Catholic nun yeah, in Spain has caused at me. Let me just read a few paragraphs here. A Catholic nun in Spain has caused outrage after she suggested the Virgin Mary may not have been virgin after all. The controversial Dominican nun invented the ire of the Catholic Church, who responded in her statement in anger. Sister Lucia uh, Caram was speaking on talk show over the weekend when she let slip her belief that contradicts one of the key pillars of her faith. I think that Mary was an Abbe Joseph and they were a normal couple and the normal thing is to have sex, Caram told Risto Meidoen during Sunday's Chester in Love program. According, yeah. So basically, she's she's sprouting heresy and she's saying that the, the Virgin Mary was uh, was. Um, not a virgin. Not a never virgin, right? Exactly. And and the thing that uh, what happens here, if 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 Jesus was the son of Joseph and Mary, this means that he he was he was just a man. 
And exactly. what happens? And, uh, there, there then was, you. Uh, Go ahead, sorry. This no no seriously. Let me just finish here. So this this one thing, it's like a diabolical arrow that's sent at the the one point which, with our you know modern scientific thinking, would be the weak point of uh, Christian theology, that is uh, the virgin birth. So what you do here is that you literally deconstruct the whole church because you're saying that Jesus was not the son of God. So you're saying that the church is not the body of Christ. And you're, you're saying that the church is not a divine construction. And, and thus you're saying that it's, it's just an institution. It's just a part of uh, its human construct. That's what you're saying implicitly. It's yes, a this heresy. Was, this was the teaching of uh, Skilobex, the, the famous uh, Roman Catholic liberal who essentially <laughs> ditched the whole thing. And yeah. Uh, yeah, he, he started with that same presupposition and then ended up with, well, yeah, well, I guess Jesus is a man. If he's just a man, then the whole thing's not true. So uh, there was, but there, there have been American uh, bishops and archbishops who have taught that openly and what? never got, yeah, never got when? censured from, never got censured from the Vatican, never got in trouble. So. I mean, what you should do with these people is that you 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 force these people to have a Vatican passport, and if they say shit like this, you just you just kindly beg the uh, the country to extraditize them to the Vatican state, and then the Pope can punish them as King of Vatican. Problem solved. <laughs> yeah, and we'll have Herod. Yeah, well, you know, that would be it'd be real nice. I mean, <clears throat> but that's not going to happen with Mr. Colin yeah, Clerk. So, yeah, it won't happen, but that's what should happen. Right, but I, I know could have, should have, would have. Um, this, this is just the same. And you know, this it comes from Spain, the country that was perhaps one of the most pious in in all of European history. I mean, this is a country of you know, Catholic, the Inquisition. This is a country of Franco. This is the the country of uh, you know uh, Loyola, even though you know maybe he was. Well, yeah, it's Spain, 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 and and Portugal have had their Masonic Republican revolutions, and now they have gay marriage and abortions. So they're yeah, it's being warped. I mean, even Spain there said that the 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 Spanish people are the one of the most pious in in. Uh, in Europe, because they have almost like a priestly mentality in their national mentality, and this is what is being worked to. I mean, the the, the Anglo's become kikes, the Germans become well, God knows what, and the, the Spaniards become this shit. It's disgusting. <laughs> it is. I don't mean to make light of it, but yeah, I mean, uh, that, that when I was a Roman Catholic for a long time, you know, I would I followed those headlines at like Nova Ordo Watch and uh, mm -hmm. um, whatever the. Uh, traditional Catholic daily or whatever all those sites were and, and you yeah, would just see family this, news see, or whatever yeah yeah you would see this stuff like non-stop in the in the trad news and then eventually it's just like why are none of these people in trouble <laughs> like they never like they'll they'll discipline uh, Lefevre they'll discipline you know the the SS yeah. guys they won't touch these people well yeah did Timothy Radcliffe said that sodomy was Eucharistic the you know superior general of the order of preachers the Dominicans well, he said it was Eucharistic. Yes, the former superior general of the. Uh, I mean, Order what the fuck? Dominican said it was Eucharistic. Dude. Yeah. Th th this is literally some Kravlian sex magic shit. This is like some it weird is. Gnostic sect. And I mean, it's it's so open at this point. I mean, shit like this makes me realize it's not we who are insane; it's everyone else. It is, and and they, uh, you know, th this was a long-term plan. Uh, you can read, you know, the the Alta Vendita. That was their. Lodge plan was to not destroy the papacy, but to turn the papacy into uh, an uh, an organ of the revolution. Yeah, that's that's insane, right? And I mean, it wouldn't even surprise me because you you have this this you know uh, lofty papal idea, and if you can just corrupt that, well, you corrupt the whole of the church. Uh, anyway, exactly. perhaps we should move on. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll take the next story. I saw this one this morning, and it. Uh... I'll just read it um, from the Washington Times. Planned Parenthood kept aborted babies alive to harvest organs, ex-technician says. Uh, kept them alive. They kept yes. them alive. Yes. What the fuck? In a new undercover video released Wednesday, a former technician for a tissue harvesting company details how an aborted baby was kept alive, that its heart could be harvested at a California Planned Parenthood facility, raising more legal questions about the group's practices. This, this, this is like some, some fucked up Moloch ritual or some shit. I mean, they, they, yeah. 
you're harvesting the heart of a living baby. I mean, what you what are you even doing with the heart? Are you doing scientific experiments with the heart? Or are you like giving it to another baby at least? I mean, what are you doing with it? Does it say that? Holly O'Donnell, a former blood and tissue procurement technician for the biotech startup STEM Express, also said she was asked to harvest an intact brain from a late-term male fetus whose heart was still beating after the abortion. What the fuck? When you watch X-Files and you see like the episodes where Mulder and Scully like break into these facilities and they've got these giant vats with like babies in, in test tubes and they're being experimented on, that's real. That's what I've been saying for a long time. Yeah. I mean, this is a late-term abortion. This is like a third trimester abortion. I mean, yes. then the baby is basically fully formed. I mean, it will survive. No problem. Well, yes. If you saw the, you know, the Project Veritas videos, I don't think any of this should be surprising. No, I saw them. Yeah, I mean, they, they, one of these the, these Planned Parenthood uh, witches, she literally said, "Oh, I want a Lamborghini. That's why I do this because I want a Lamborghini, and this Lamborghini right. this would really give me happiness when I am dead." Well, yeah, I mean, uh, this is hell if she doesn't repent. You know, I mean, the thing is, is um. I mean, these stories, I mean, it, it's like we talk about this more or less every week. I mean, we have stories like this, and... There is no end. No, well, that's what I try to sell people, is like, hell is, in fact, a bottomless pit. And there is no, like, end to the levels of depravity that human beings are capable of sinking. And, you know, we're living, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah were, were destroyed for much. Uh, much less severe crimes than are committed on a daily basis all across the Western world. Yeah, no, that could be debated, I suppose. Fucking elbow. Well, I mean, it's... And, I mean, the, the thing is, they keep they keep pushing for all this depraved shit. I mean, they're, they're pushing for pedosexuals now. Yeah, let's become pedosexuals. That's a thing, by the way, that they literally push for this now. And the thing is, if you react to God, you react to morals which spring from God. The morals themselves is a result of, you know, having God. So when you detach God from the morals, the morals are just slowly rotting away. And then you can justify this shit because this, this uh, you know, norm-critical mentality is the constant. It's not a slippery slope because this norm-critical mentality is always there. That's what I've been saying now for like, I don't know, 15 episodes. And it's, it's uh, very important to realize. And that's, you can't really have a healthy society without God. You can't have a healthy society without the church. And this is what you get eventually. Yeah, this has been going on for a long time because I was reading uh, Fire in the Minds of Men recently and like the French Revolutionary publications, it was like, I guess like agitprop political stuff mixed with pornography. And then uh, he, the author also says later on, where is it? Um, it was like uh, Thomas Paine, the American Revolutionary, uh, and several other French revolutionary luminaries were like extensive collectors of pornography. Um, and they had, a lot of the symbols are adapted from pagan sex symbols. Um, so it's not, I mean, I guess it's has a long heritage. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I had, I had a couple Go on, really good. Well, I had a couple really good uh, French Revolution classes in undergrad and grad that, that really actually dove into this stuff. That, that was like the one non-liberal professor I had was my uh, French Revolution professor. <laughs> and uh, so, and now he wasn't any kind of conspiracy theorist or anything like that, but it, ironically, it all came up. Like it, it would come up in even the mainline literature about the French Revolution that, you know, a lot of these people were illuminists. A lot of them were coming out of the lodges and uh, yeah, it's conspiratorial, but it's not really a conspiracy. So it's like, what? <laughs> but yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is the beginning of the modern uh, revolutionary period. And, and you get, you know, out of that, the whole thing is uh, a war on throne and altar. And that's why yeah. the whole world, the whole world now has these democratic republics. So yeah, and they even want to destroy everything that even resembles, you know, a religion or God. I mean, here in Sweden, for example, we have pride flags on our altars in the churches at times. We have pride flags. I mean, even the pride flag. I mean, that that's like perverting the promise so, of the flood rights. So think of. Oh, uh, aha! You're not going to turn us now. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, it's okay. Like, so people laugh at reading Chronicles and First and Second Samuel and Ezekiel 
and Ezekiel uh, has this vision where he looks into the temple and he sees the priests are doing the service of God and then they secretly at night go underground and they have like this uh, underground you know cave where they're like worshiping the sun and doing all this secret stuff uh, and so people people laugh at that oh ha ha you're so stupid you believe the Old Testament you believe uh, Samuel and Ezekiel and lo and behold like this is the world that we now see <laughs> we now see you know like Baal and Moloch and and uh, these these entities and and ultimately you know a, a pride flag on the altar is just another yeah. manifestation of that same thing. So we live in the same world as Ezekiel. Yeah, I mean, you, just to get a bit off topic, you will back to the topic, perhaps. Well, that's you know, a, this, that's these a, abortion uh, shits. You know, I, I mean, mean that's, that's sorry, go on, Hans. I mean, stem cell research. That's essentially the same thing as well. I mean, what you're doing with stem cells is that you, you're like taking. No, the, the very the very thing that will grow into a a normal human being, and you're you're like crushing that, and you're building something else with it to to help another so-called human being, and another you know I don't know rich oligarch or some shit. And th that's that's literally demonic as well. Well, it's the same mentality. Well, it's, 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 yeah, yeah, and that's Go like ahead. with the transhumanism thing. Because what is stem cells? Yes. Yeah, what is stem cells for? It's to prolong life as much as possible. Which you know you yeah. need that if you're a total nihilist. And yeah, I mean, uh, your source that. needs that if he's going to be in the the uh, machine blowing uh, stars up, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's the thing. I mean, you can't get to Emperor, Emperor Palpatine type age without those stem cells, you know? <laughs> I mean, David Rockefeller had five heart transplants? I think it's six or seven now. Oh, excuse yeah. me. Yeah, it's insane. <laughs> it's like... Okay, uh, uh, Speech, do you want, to, uh, you want to pick your last article and then we'll uh, close it up? Yeah, I can do... Kind of continuing on the same theme. This is what it's like to fall in love with your sibling. Defying oh, laws man. and social taboos, one couple shares their undeniable connection. There is no end. Yeah. Until she was 40, Melissa thought she was an only child. For the first decade of her life, she grew up in a happy, suburban, upper-middle-class area of the Great Lakes. Then her father committed suicide, and soon after, her mother's mental health began to decline. Oh. Uh, bu -bu -bu. Fucking hell. Trying to I mean, just you read. Have the, you have the explanation right there. I mean, like yeah. Yeah, that says, in January 2015, a Facebook friend request came from Chris, a man she didn't know. Well, clearly this is her brother. Uh, yeah, so then you can infer from the rest they have uh, this relationship. But I guess, you know, that's just continuing the destruction of normal uh, relationships, normal yeah. family. Um you know, speaking yeah. of, uh, you, know, you know, the destruction of normal family and, you know, all this, I, just, just a quick detour. Uh, the Swedish state television has made a new series now, by the way. And this series is all about, it's called Bonus Family or Plus Family. And this is, you know, you, you, you get children, you divorce, then you, you know, marry again, you get children, you divorce. And, you know, this constant cycle. So it's like... It's like just a mess with all family ties, and they're making, you know, they're trying to make it look cute and, you know, preferable to pander to all these single mothers out there, and it's it's fucking insane. It's 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 a sick reflection of what this godforsaken country has become now. I mean, people laugh at Sweden. I mean, it, yeah, this and is in the America, reason why they do it. like even going back several decades in America, like uh, that. The sitcom The Brady Bunch that was like designed to show like uh, mixed, like two divorced parent, two divorced families could like come together and be could like work. You know, it's like yeah. a way of promoting That's, divorce. Take The Brady Bunch on uh, crack cocaine, and you have uh, you know the plus family that the state media, that is the state media, not even trying to hide it at this point, <laughs> is trying to you know show us a good and cute and preferable thing. And since the state is our god now, you know this is like a uh, a license to be a uh, you know total uh, total fucktard. Uh, like <laughs> that's the only technical term I can say. Total fucktard. Uh. 
Oh man, yeah. I mean, so like you know, long story short, <clears throat> America is the great Satan. We are approaching the eschaton. The bounds of the physical and the spiritual world are rapidly disintegrating, and we are once again living in the age of iniquity before the the flood. So expect uh, international, intergalactic, you know, Nephilim empire, AI antichrist and uh, the whole fucking boot to come with it. Well, Florian, this is why we need Richard Spencer's White Imperium. <laughs> That's how we're gonna stop the Nephilim. The only, way, the only way we can stop the international Judeo-Nephilim empire is, so by, is by returning to white bourgeois 1920s America. I still think, yeah, the source of Bionicle is cool. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs>